This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com. The only place to be in your pop culture world. This is It Was a Thing on TV. Spoiler number one is Dr. Lee Franz. It stinks. What is going on? (laughs) What is going on? Hello, Place to Be Nation. This is Greg Diener from the It Was a Thing on TV podcast. And before we begin our trio of episodes for you here on Place to Be Nation. It should be noted that we recorded these episodes back in mid-December, and considering he is a subject that comes up in two of the three episodes in this collection, we would like to take a moment to note the recent passing of Fred Silverman, the former president of CBS, ABC, and NBC, and, of course, created many shows, uh, like In the Heat of the Night and later a future subject on Place to Be Nation when we get to 21 as part of the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire knockoffs episode. We here at It Was a Thing on TV would like to send our condolences to the family of Fred Silverman. May he rest in peace. Now, before we get started on Today's trio of episodes on the It Was the Thing on TV podcast here at Place to Be Nation. I just want to note in the Hello Larry and Tommy Westfall Universe episodes, if I sound like I'm in a well, like Timmy on last year or something, I, I just want to note we were recording these episodes the Sunday the Kansas City Chiefs were playing the New England Patriots. And because I really hate the New England Patriots, I had my TV on mute and I was watching the game while recording the episode at the same time. So in in case I sound like I'm in a well, that explains why. Now enjoy today's trio of episodes from the It Was a Thing on TV podcast. As first, we review the McLean Stevenson 1979 classic? Sitcom, Hello Larry. Enjoy. Welcome to the It Was a Thing on TV podcast, episode 12, submission 006. Hello Larry. Hello Larry aired on NBC from January 26th of 1979 to April 30th of 1980 for a total of 38 episodes. Well, hello Larry. I'm joined by Chico Alexander and Greg Diener, and we're looking at a show that people have actually told us, you need to cover this, you need to cover this. And we said, whoa, slow your roll. We're going to cover it. And it just happens we're covering it today. Uh, I want to start just with the theme song. Feelings? Comments? It's 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 an earworm. Uh, The kids would call it a bop. But I'm doing my research, and it said the death of the theme song, which is totally unfair because you have Jeff C. Frederick and Bennett Salve not ten years later. It, it is quite the earworm, and actually, that's the one thing I'm, I'm when I'm seeing stuff uh, about Hello Larry podcasts and and uh, video reviews. The one thing a lot of people say is the theme song is like so epic, and I, I agree. It's a great theme song. It's very catchy. But also, similar to what we said in Lidsville, this does really sort of set up what the show is about or the series is about. Yeah, I mean, again, 
You talk to it's like let's go over this line by line if we shout. Hello, Indeed. Larry. Hello, Larry. Hello, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Hello. We, yeah, Greg and I will be the backup singers. Okay. Yeah. Hello, Larry. Hello, Hello Larry. Larry. You talk to people all day for a living. Hello, Larry. Hello, Larry. Of course, of course, he's going to talk to people all day for a living because he's a, he's a talk radio DJ. I don't think he's is he a sh- would you, would you call him a radio shrink? Is that what he is? A radio shrink? He, he was Frasier fifteen years before Frasier was a series. Okay, so I, I think it's a fair analysis. Yes. Oh yes. yes. Uh, but all those easy answers you are giving, are you really living your life that way? Or so he's like, a hypocrite. Yeah, so, yeah, it's like he's giving answers to questions that fit conveniently in between the commercials as radio shrinks are wont to do. Uh, uh, Portland is a long way from L.A., and again, this is oh. a crucial plot point because... Uh, Larry was, what, a successful psychiatrist shrink in Los Angeles before he moved to L.A. with, and this is where the second verse comes in. Hello, Larry. Hello, Larry. Two kids to raise alone just ain't that easy. Hello, Larry. Hello, Larry. Yeah, so, yeah he uh, he moved to, uh, from Los Angeles to Portland. By the way, I got from our notes here. Portland is actually only 820 miles from L.A. That's still a long damn distance. It, it's a two-day trip. Okay. Not if you got it. Anyway, uh, again, he moved there with his two daughters. Uh, the questions they're asking aren't that breezy. They're, that's like... Hello, Larry. Now, there's not a hello, Larry there. Read the script. Oh, okay. The answers you're giving don't always pay, but that's the way it is with kids today. But yeah, it's like Larry's job, he has those problems that fit nice and neat in between the commercials on the radio show. Uh, When he comes home, his two daughters have a little bit more to uh, ask about life, the universe, and everything. And we'll get to that in a little bit, yes. Yep. Okay, uh, going into the uh, end here, the calls are coming in. Yeah, better start to grin, because you never know just what they're going to say. Hello, Hello Larry. Larry. Hello, Larry. Hello, Hello Larry. Larry. Hello, Larry. Hello, Larry. Hello, Larry. <laughs> well... Hello, Larry. And that is the theme song. Again, very expository. That last bit is just self-explanatory right there, because you really don't know what's going to say. Like, this show was bas- this show is basically Frasier with kids. Well, also, I want to add that that was the first season lyrics, because there was a slight change in the second season, and we're going to get also into that later, the, the changes between season one and season two. So the line that went, the calls are coming in, you better start to grin which was about his his radio side, was changed to, you're raising them just fine regarding the kids, but keep an open mind because you never know just what they're going to say. So, Hello, Larry. <laughs> Hello, Larry. Hello, Larry. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the theme song paints a beautiful picture as to what to expect, and it is a bit of an earworm. And uh, it's just a darn shame the rest of the show wasn't as good as the theme. But this is sort of a, a commonality in, with NBC back in 1979. And spoiler, we're going to be covering more shows from uh, NBC in 1979 in the future. I'm not going to tell you which ones. You could probably yeah, guess. You, you have an idea of what's coming. Yeah, I, I, there, there's one that's probably right on the top of your head, and we're like, yeah, we're, wait we're, we're way ahead. It. We're wait way ahead. For it. Yeah, just, just be patient. But uh, yeah, I, I shared with uh, the gentleman uh, earlier uh, the uh, the Friday night lineup for NBC on that premiere night, that January 26th of 1979. It started off with different strokes. Which is a great show. It, it is a, a submission on our list, though, for a couple of reasons. Uh, and then after that was Brothers and Sisters, 
yet another submission. Follow the trend here. And then at 9 o'clock, you had turnabout. Guess what? Another submission. Then Hello Larry was at 9.30. And then 10 o'clock was sweepstakes with uh, Ed Burns. Spoiler, another submission. So, yeah, it, 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 if there's that many submissions, uh, I think right there is like five or six submissions for one night. Yeah, NBC, yeah, there's something wrong there. Um, but also on top of that, uh, just those shows doing so bad within a month, a month, a month of, of the premiere, Hello Larry moved from 9.30 on Friday nights to 8.30 on Friday nights, which might actually say a lot about brothers and sisters and, and, uh, and turnabout, the two shows that got bumped from the schedule. And then actually you had different strokes, Hello Larry. Then you had the Rockford Files. And then you had Sweepstakes again for a very short run. It didn't last much longer. So, yeah, this is just like NBC in 1979 in a nutshell, at least among its nighttime offerings. Daytime it did significantly better. But, again, that's another episode. And, yeah, NBC almost went bankrupt, again, primarily over one show, which is a submission, and also Fred Silverman. I mean, it just, it just almost killed the network. Yeah, but let's that, talk about Fred Silverman for a second. Okay, keep it clean. Well, we know Fred Silverman had this history at CBS and ABC as, as this genius programming executive, and when he got to NBC in the late 70s, everyone thought, well, it's now going to be NBC's turn to get some of that Fred Silver and magic. And, well, uh, his golden goose uh, turned into a pumpkin very quick. Well, I'm going to agree and disagree with you. Um, just last night, as a matter of fact, I, I was listening to a new-to-me podcast called Mobituaries, done by Mo Rocca. Yes. Very good podcast. I, I, I got I to say, it's a great podcast. I subscribed to it uh, after I listened to this episode. And the episode, uh, his episode this week had to do with the uh, the death of, of uh, the country broadcasting system when uh, CBS went all rural with uh, Hee Haw and Green Acres and Petticoat Junction and Beverly Hillbillies and uh, Andy Griffith and Gomer Pyle and – Mayberry RFD, all those rural shows, and who's the person who uh, who, who canceled all those shows? Fred Silverman. Fred Silverman. So, and, and yeah, I could understand partially, you know, why it was done. I mean, you're you're, re you're reaching out at the time to the rural people who, at the time would have just started getting television or getting access to television. I get that, and that would be something that interests them. But also in another way, you're, you're killing the, the golden goose kind of sort of because, you know, Beverly Hillbillies had been on for a good, at that point, seven years or so. And Green Acres had been on five or six years. And Petticoat Junction had been on for just about as long. And Hee Haw had only been on for about, I think, two or three years at that point. Uh, and, of course, Hee Haw found future life in – in syndication. And if I and remember correctly, I think Hee Haw might be on our list in, in some capacity. I think the Hee Haw Honeys are on the list. Hee Haw Honeys, that's what it is, yes. Well, but 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 still, Hee Haw I, I, had lived on for darn close to 20 years longer in syndication. And even now, you know, in 2019, on the verge of being 2020, you can still see Hee Haw reruns on RFD television. Albeit, I think they're older reruns. I think from the late '80s and, er, and mid '80s, they're not going back to the '70s or anything like that. But still, it, it has some popularity. Hey, as we, long as I as long as I get to see Victoria Holman, then all good. We we know, Greg. We know. Calm down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but also, I mean, but but also at the same time, Fred Silverman, he did bring good things to ABC. Yeah, he he did bring aboard. Love Boat, 
And Three's Lim- company. Three's company. Three's company. Yeah. Welcome and, back, Cotter. Welcome back, Cotter. Uh, he would have been there, I believe, around the time Happy Days started. Yeah, Happy Days started 74 or 75. 74, right. Uh, so, yeah, uh, but I'm more focusing on Love Boat, which sort of – is it, sort of a uh, foreshadowing to uh, a, a future episode or two. We're not going to get into it, but but, but yeah, he he did bring these very big shows. He he was in control when ABC really had a, a superstar lineup. Mork and Mindy would have been probably right at the end of his tenure. That would have been about seventy eight or so. Yes, seventy eight. Yeah. So. Yeah, so he did well there. CBS, I mean, admittedly, if you think about it, even though he ki- he killed off the rural shows, what did he put in its place in like seventy seventy one? All in the Family, which then sprung on to the Jeffersons Maud. and Good Times and Maud, and I mean that's like the seventies right there in a nutshell. That's like Norman Lear's nineteen seventies. All in the Family, Maud, Good Times, Jeffersons. I mean that, that that's I mean if it, that was all that uh, that Fred Silverman did at CBS, that would be huge. But also you've got Mash, and I'm trying to think what else he would have had in, in, on CBS. Well, he had uh, CBS would have been Kojak, I believe. Yes, and and that ran from the like mid 70s till I want to say about 78 or so, 77, 78. So yeah. So, so, so Fred Silverman did good at CBS. He did good at ABC. He comes to NBC with these grand plans, and he just absolutely poops the bed. And Fred Silverman was still getting work. I mean, even 20 years ago, he was, I think, one of the, the minds behind 21, or at least he was associated with 21 in his, some way. It, yeah, his production uh, yeah. company was behind 21. And, oh, also, spoiler, another submission. <laughs> so, so many spoilers. Get on with it, Mike. <laughs> well, look at the the connections here. All these things have to do with Fred Silverman, and they're all these submissions we're going to cover in the future. Um, but, yeah, so, so it just, you know, I just think NBC and, and Fred Silverman is bad luck. Don't put them together. Uh, they're, they're like and, oil and water. And, they just don't know. Unless it's Matt Locke. Or in the heat of the night. Okay, good points, but still, I mean, (laughs) that's two shows, and we've got, I mean, just like five or six that we just mentioned that are are busts, and that's only just from from winter of 79. There's other busts from 80 we could talk about. Oh, and again, we will, but moving on. But yeah, you mentioned it moved from Friday to from Friday at nine thirty to Friday at eight thirty, and it yeah. stayed there. And it stayed there. And stayed there uh, until episode seven of season two. Right. It moved, yeah. Oh, I, oh, yeah. You can finish it. I, I no, yeah, oh, it moved to Wednesday at nine thirty. Along with different strokes, different strokes yeah. made the move as well. So they kept the different strokes and and Hello Larry combo together. And technically, Hello Larry's not a spinoff of Different Strokes. They're sort of adjacent. I think that would be the best way of of phrasing it, because there were crossover episodes. There were actually three crossover episodes where the the cast of of Hello Larry went to Different Strokes and vice versa. Uh, One of them had to do with uh, Mr. Drummond was going to buy the TV, or not the TV station, Mr. Drummond was going to buy the radio station, and so he went up and visited his friend uh, Larry Alder, and uh, and Phil Drummond was considering downsizing uh, the station. And then in season two, uh, the Drummond family actually welcomed the Alders to New New York City, because Larry was auditioning for his own television talk show there. And that was another crossover episode with the different strokes. Uh, and actually all these episodes of hello, Larry that we're talking about are actually within the different strokes syndication package. So if there's reruns anywhere, I know there used to be some on one of the stars channels, I believe uh, maybe it's at me TV or antenna TV, 
but yeah, it's entirely possible you could see these pop up in in, uh, in reruns on those shows. And then the third episode, uh, the Olders go back to New York City again. Larry tries pitching the sale of a, of a TV station he wants to manage to Philip Drummond's company. So there's a, a lot going on there, and it's I, I, yeah, I really want to find these episodes now. I, I really want to see how they interact because different strokes. I mean, I think is one of the best sitcoms of the '70s and, and early to mid '80s. It's one of my favorites uh, growing up. And Hello, Larry is one I just don't remember. You two wouldn't have been born yet, and I would have been all of about four when it aired, four or five. So I, I just don't remember seeing it and don't even remember the theme song. And usually I am a magnet for those types of things. So now the the cast. Now we uh, mentioned that uh, Larry Larry Alder was played by the one and only McLean Stevenson. He of the McLean Stevenson show. He of leaving Mash after the third season. Uh, <laughs> he of in the beginning. In the beginning, Dirty Dancing, Condo. The many, final season of the uh, 70s era match game. Final, yeah. season, final season of the 70s. Yeah, the, the, well, actually at that point, early 80s syndicated match game. So, yeah, McLean Stevenson, who's sort of like a poster boy for bad shows. He was Larry Alder, the the main character. And then uh, Diane Alder, one of his daughters in season one, was played by Donna Wilkes. But then in season two, was played by Krista Erickson. So changing daughters mid-season, that's that's something. Uh, And then the other daughter, Ruthie, was played by Kim Richards, whose name you may recognize She's one of the housewives of Beverly Hills. Also, if you've seen the meme of the woman yelling at the cat, I mean, who doesn't love that meme first off? But I if love you've that seen meme. that, oh, that meme is so good. She's the sister of the woman in that meme who's holding back the woman that's screaming. That's Kyle Richards screaming at the woman. <laughs> so that's who Kim Richards is, if you aren't entirely familiar with her. Uh, and then uh, you had Joanna Gleason, daughter of Marty Hall, by the way, who played Morgan Winslow, who was the producer of the show, of the radio show. And then you had uh, George Mamoli, who was Earl, who played sort of the bumbling, goofy engineer. Um, if anything, I think he's more known, at least on this show, he was a big guy. I mean, yeah, he must God. have been, he must have been pushing at least four to four hundred and fifty pounds. He he was a very big guy. And then uh, season two, there were some cast changes. We mentioned uh, Diane Alders being played by a different uh, person, but also the focus switched more from Larry's radio life to his home life. And we then got uh, one of his neighbors, Leona Wilson, played by Ruth Brown. We also got Larry's dad, Henry, who is played by Fred Stuffman. And uh, and there was a neighbor kid. I can't remember the neighbor kid's name. His neighbor kid is John, is Tommy. Tom, uh, of Tommy. course, another Tommy, of course. Uh, I'm and, sure it's and, not Tammy like last time. No, no, it's it's Tommy. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, and Tommy, it's Tammy. Tommy was played by John Famia, and he was like the little pain in the ass neighborhood kid. You just wanted to like secretly just like pop over the head when he was saying stupid. I mean, I, I did not like him on on the episode that I saw. And the thing is, yeah, speaking of the episodes, there's only two out there. Yeah. Uh, there's a season one episode and a season two episode, so we can sort of compare and contrast the yeah. two seasons that way. But yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, to give you sort of a, a mental picture, imagine Tommy at, is the uh, Steve Urkel to Ruthie's Laura Winslow. That's actually a good comparison. I like that. Except, except I don't think that Steve Urkel was ever as annoying as this kid. As, as oh, Tommy. yes, he was. <laughs> well, well, not, maybe my threshold of, of pain with with uh, Steve Urkel was a little 
higher than yours. But I, I just I, Tommy, I found be, to be very annoying. And then actually, Tommy also, if the name doesn't ring a, b- a bell, John Famia, he actually uh, ended up on another possible future submission. <laughs> oh. Square pegs. Oh. Yeah, I, I was actually uh, just within the last week or so uh, watching some uh, some opens from 80 shows, and here's Square Pegs, and I see the name John Famia. It's like, oh my gosh, that's the, the 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 annoying little brat from season two of Hello Larry. So, at least he went on to do something else besides uh, the second season of Hello Larry. Hell, he, sh- he shared a stage with Sarah Jessica Parker. We should all be so lucky. <laughs> so yeah, uh, as I said earlier, in season one, the show, even though it didn't totally focus on Larry's work life, there was still time at the radio station. But but still, a lot of the episodes were devoted to his relationship with his family. And then season two was pretty much your your standard sitcom fare uh, in terms of family sitcom. Oh wait, wait. But Mike, Mike. Whoa! You yes. Forgot, you forgot the. You forgot one really big, or I should say, one really tall character in season two. Oh, I did! I did! And yes, um, in the and, most and meta. Is, but, but he's, not, he's not as tall as McLean Stevenson, though. So. Oh. He's not that oh. tall. Yes, I just realized. Yes, I know yeah, what you're talking so we just about. Totally we just totally blew off Metal Arc Lemon. Yeah, yep. Metal Arc Lemon, the, the Harlem Globetrotter, played himself as a series, and he was a sporting goods store owner. And I can't say anything about him because he wasn't in that season two episode that's online. Uh, so I don't know what he brought to the festivities besides the Metal Arc Lemon name. Here's a celebrity. Uh, yeah. The occasional basketball trip. I, I think that was. Co- I think that was contractually stipulated that he do one of that per episode. I don't know. Yeah, or, or maybe he like every episode dumped a, a a bucket of confetti on on McLean Stevenson. Who knows? Yeah, he, he probably did something very Harlem Globetrotter ish. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that it just reminds me now that you say that again. Another thing I just ran into probably about a month ago or so was when metal arc lemon was the guest star on. Okay. Boomer or not. Okay. Boomer. <laughs> I wish that I went. Okay. <laughs> boomer. Oh my gosh. The show we all wish was real. <laughs> oh my gosh. Here's boomer. I'm sorry. Though I'd love to see a show called Okay Boomer. Oh my god! You never know. It could, it could be on the CBS fall schedule. You never know. <laughs> so yeah, uh, here's Boomer. Oh my gosh! Another future submission by the. <laughs> so so yeah. So apparently, uh, in the early '80s, Metal Arc Lemon was making the rounds. Uh, doing guest appearances on talk sh- or not talk shows on TV shows and uh, sitcoms, and I mean he would have been probably I'm guessing mid 40s, late 40s, early 50s at the time. So he probably maybe outlived his his lifespan being a Harlem Globetrotter. Yeah, he was it was a uh, mid to late for he was in his mid to late 40s. Yeah, and so yeah. Uh, as we said, the show uh, changed its focus from Larry's work life to his home life in season two. And going through the episodes, and we're not going to go episode by episode, but uh, and at least comment because we can't really comment or, or, or about the episodes since they're we really haven't seen them. But. Um, uh, starting with episode one in 79, Diane's boyfriend is putting pressure on her to go all the way. Okay, that sounds like typical teenage fare. I mean, whether it's 1979 or 2019. Uh, episode two, Ruthie is rejected at school by her friends as they learn her dad is a local outspoken talk show host. 
So obviously that tells us that Larry was very controversial on the air. Well, I mean, it's in the theme song. We mentioned that earlier. Uh, the calls are coming in. You better start to grin because you just never know what they're going to say. And the questions they're asking aren't that breezy. The answers you're given don't always pay, but that's the way it is with kids today. So, yeah, I, I mean, Larry was, to say the least, a little controversial. Uh, episode three, and, th- and what, this actually we haven't even mentioned at this point. The key uh, thing to take out of the show is Larry was raising his daughters. We haven't mentioned anything about a wife. He actually was divorced from his wife. And his ex-wife makes uh, appearances in season two. We'll get to that momentarily. And the uh, ex-wife was played by Shelley Fabre, who you would know better from Coach. <laughs> so, uh, episode three, Larry receives his divorce papers, his final divorce papers, and struggles with his and the girl's emotions reacting to the official end of his marriage. So, I mean, there's a semi-serious topic there. That, it, it, like I said, it, it's it, it, it's really sort of like a microcosm of stuff that you would have seen in the 70s and early 80s. I mean, I know divorces weren't terribly popular or maybe even kind of forbidden until maybe the the early 70s or late 60s. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this is a reality now. Divorces, uh, and, and, and I'm talking about now, not just 2019, but in 1979, divorce was a real thing. Uh, episode four, Homesick Diane begins to miss her boyfriend in L.A., so she decides to hitch her way back. Again, puppy love. Uh, uh, Diane and Ruthie begin to miss their mom, and Morgan helps fill the void. Now, here's so, the uh, now here's uh, the sh- sort of episode that you pretty much want to see coming, because, again, here's a female character. Here are two kids. They're missing their mom. She could, Morgan, the producer, she could be the mom. It just makes sense. And again, there's a sense of realism there. That that's a real thing that happens when uh, with a divorced family. So, like I said, there it, it it's almost 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 sounding like it's coming off like a drama. There's a lot of very realistic plot lines here. I mean, this isn't just well, dopey it, comedy. You no, know, it's it's one of those smart comedies that come out of the age because if you look at the at, at yeah, look at the credits, guess what else they did. They did One Day at a Time for CBS. Yes, they did. Similar circumstances, but let's just change the role a little bit. Instead of, you know, Larry and his daughters moving for, uh, to Portland, you have Alice and her son moving to Arizona. Oh, it just made oh. it yeah. Oh. Oh. Mm. But, yeah. It, it's, oh. It, it, it's an interesting parallel you mentioned there. Episode six, uh, Ruthie and her friend Eric develop a case of puppy love. Oh, there's a phrase that I just mentioned, puppy love, and aren't sure how to react. Uh, episode seven, recently divorced Larry goes on a date with Morgan's sister, much to Morgan's worry. Don't tell us. Yeah, yeah we haven't been there. Here, I'm going to hook you yeah. up with my, my best friend or my sister, and you guys can go on a date. We We know how that usually ends. Yeah. Yeah, not from experience though. We can't. No, not I'm the uh, I'm the mayor of beautiful ta- downtown. There, thank you very much. Jeez. Oh, uh, episode eight. It's feared that Diane is on uppers when Larry finds them in her purse. Wow, that seems like a plot from a, from a 2019 episode. Seems very timely. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's one of those things that's almost timeless because. Yeah, how many times have we seen episodes where, oh, little Billy's got drugs? I mean, going back to uh, different strokes, there was an episode where they had the president's wife on saying, don't do drugs. So, yeah, it's, it, it sounds like just another plot line, which, again, has a sense of realism to it because it's it's definitely not fake. That's especially nowadays, given the, the opioid crises. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, episode nine, new tenant Leona moves into Larry's building and aids his daughters, but angers him. And then, uh, episode 10 is actually 
where uh, the Drummonds come to Portland and uh, and Philip Drummond is considering downsizing Larry's station. So there's that first crossover with with different strokes. Uh, and actually, that would have I'm going to uh, just make a, an assumption here. Since this was called the trip part two, I would assume the trip part one aired half an hour earlier. That's since an different strokes was the lead in. That's yeah. an episode of different strokes. Yeah. Right. So that's a nice little way to connect the the the, the, the gap there. I, I I like that. Uh, episode eleven before a party at the Alders, Ruthie's boyfriend Eric gets a crush on Diane. Uh oh. Uh, episode 12, the girls compete to see which one takes better care of their sick father. Episode 13, Ruthie gets to do her own talk show for a school project. She uses Ooh. Larry's radio show airtime. Okay, well, there's something that you don't generally see on uh, – that isn't a boilerplate sitcom plot. That, that's actually kind of interesting. I heard an ooh from Greg. Did you want to say something? Uh, no, I just I just think that's, that's amazing. Ruthie, does, Ruthie has her own <laughs> Takes her dad's spare time. It's take your daughter to work day on the radio. And uh, the final episode of season one, Diane catches Ruthie stealing. Again, another timeless episode. Yeah, because that hasn't been done 20,000 times before or since. And and the one episode that actually is online uh, on YouTube from season one is Ruthie's first crush. Aww. Which is episode six, the one where uh, her and Eric get a case of puppy love and aren't sure how to react. So then we come back with season two. And the first episode is, again, a crossover with different strokes. The Drummond family welcomes the Alders to New York City as Larry auditions there for a TV talk show. And again, the uh, different strokes, presumably from that night. And actually, since this was September of 79... And it's a season premiere. Oh, I'm sure NBC was boosting this like all over the place. Oh, well, it's different strokes. And then we're going to have the different strokes cast. Come on. Hello, Larry. It's going to be an hour you want to watch. And then a two part episode. And apparently this uh, aired the same night. Diane, thinking Ruthie is too much of a tomboy, convinces Ruthie to go to a school dance with a nice boy her age. Her own age. But during that date, Ruthie develops a crush on Cubby, a slick-talking 17-year-old young man who intends to make the inexperienced younger girl his next conquest. Oh, dear. Oh, this isn't going to end well. After inviting Cubby over without Larry's permission, Ruthie must swiftly learn how to deal with Cubby and his more grown-up intentions toward her. Oh, somebody's going to get their ass whooped. Yeah, like you guys said, this isn't going to end well. I don't th- think you want to make McLean Stevenson upset. He, but, was hey, a, he was a Korean. Yeah, come on now. Well, as the, the lyrics said in season two, you're raising them just fine, but keep an open mind. But that's the way it is with kids today. Oh, for the love of God, no. I went there. Uh, You've got to keep an open mind, Larry, but that's the way it is with kids in the late 70s. Okay, here's where the ex-wife comes into play. Larry's ex-wife, Marion, comes to visit while Larry has to leave town with Morgan on a business trip. And again, as I mentioned earlier, Marion was played by Shelley Fabry. And then this actually is a two-part episode. The next week, Ruthie keeps hoping her parents will get back together and tries much persuasion. Larry and Marion go out and have an interesting evening. And again, that's been done before where they separate, at least on other TV shows, temporarily separate, contemplate divorcing. But then, oh, I miss the big guy. I mean, specifically, the thing that comes to my mind is there was a three-part episode uh, on the last season of Married with Children, which did just about this exact same thing. Oh, by the way, the final season of Married with Children is a future submission. <laughs> oh. Let's just get all our submissions out of here in one way or another. But yeah, uh, uh, Alan okay. Peg Bundy, they went to a therapist, decided uh, that uh, they were going to split. Al lived on his own, was very bored, lived in this shabby apartment, and uh, and Peg was very... Um, she was missing the big guy. She was missing Al, 
And she actually went on a date with somebody. And Greg, you won't believe who she went on a date with. McClay um, Stevenson. Well, 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 not the character name, but the actor name. Not um, McClay Stevenson. Oh, I think McClay yeah, he, might have been dead by then. He was already dead by the last season of Married with Children. Oh, Greg. Yeah, the, the person I'm talking about? Oh. Alan Thicke! <laughs> oh, oh, yes, I'm be Alan Thicke, and I'm going to be dating Peggy Bundy. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I knew Greg would like that. <laughs> uh, then, uh, goodbye, Marion. Larry and Marion announced they're getting remarried. However, they run into problems on where they will live and where they'll work. Because Marion is in L.A. and Larry's in Portland. and Portland is Portland's a long way from L.A., yeah. <laughs> we, we went over this already. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's right there in the theme song, for heaven's sakes. Uh, episode 21, uh, Larry, looking for extra work, gets an offer to host a new beauty pageant. But the catch is he has to be nude, too. Oh no! Hello, Larry. Larry. <laughs> Hello, Larry. I don't, don't want to think of McLean Stevenson naked. No. Why do you have to put that thought in my head, Mike? Why? Hey, hey, blame NBC. Forty years ago, it's not my fault. I'm just the messenger. This was, this was NBC in 1980. They needed the ratings. Right. Even a naked McLean Stevenson will get ratings somehow. Uh, episode 22, Morgan becomes Larry's boss, and Larry is, Larry is jealous of her new position and promotion. Okay, that, again, is very realistic. You know, somebody gets a promotion, and, and there's some level of jealousy. Uh, episode 23, Marion's new fiancé comes to visit, and he mentions... Uh, that uh, he and Marion are uh, are going to get shared custody of the girls. Again, serious issue back in the uh, 70s with split families and divorces and all that. Yep. Episode 24, another crossover with different strokes. The Alders go to New York City one more time as Larry tries to pitch the sale of a television station he wants to manage to fill Drummond's company. And again, that's within the Different Strokes syndication package. Uh, episode 25, huge troubles arise when Diane develops a big drinking problem. Again, reality. That, that's, a, uh, that's something that, that's true to life. 26, Tommy has to move in temporarily with the Alders while his mother's away. Oh, I feel bad for you, Larry. you got to deal with all oh. this. Oh, I bet some wacky shenanigans happen. Oh, oh, you know hilarity ensued. Absolutely. Uh, episode 27. Now, here's where we get to meet Larry's father. Larry's father moves in, and against Larry's wishes, he gives Diane money to buy a car. Episode 28. What? I'm sorry? <laughs> Wait, what? Larry's, Larry's wishes... Where Larry's father moves in, and against Larry's wishes, he gives Diane money to buy a car. Does that not sound like every grandparent you've ever known? Yes, if my grandparent, that, my grandma, grandpa gave me money to buy a car, I'd be like, thank you. I get what you're saying. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. If you're the uh, the parent, if you're in the Larry position at this point, you'd be like, hey, you know what? She wants a car. You just saved me. Two thousand dollars, or however much a beater would have cost back in in nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty. Also, McCle also McClay Stevenson's character of Larry. He has to, how much money is he making at this radio station? He I can't have afford, no idea. But uh, he, he, can't he can't afford to. He, he can't, can't afford, afford to give his daughter. He can't afford to give his daughter a used car in nineteen seventy nine. What the hell? He can't afford a Datsun. But I thought everybody could afford a Datsun. Yeah, I mean, Ford Pintos were like, you know, new. They probably weren't much more than about four or $5,000, and I say that from experience. Yeah, we had one in the family. Episode 28, Larry's ex-wife Marion sends a... Oh, another money thing. Larry's ex-wife Marion sends a sizable check to help him buy a house for his daughters. And in the process, it changes Larry's pride. So now, wait. 
He didn't. He couldn't buy a car for his daughter, or at least his father was going to buy the car. Now the next episode, the ex-wife sends money to him to buy a house. This must this must be a running gag about how notoriously cheap Larry must be. Oh jeez. I think you might be right. Episode 29, and this is the season two episode, and this is on Vimeo, if I remember correctly. Ruthie gets into a fight with her new piano teacher, who is very much disliked. He dies after their argument, and Ruthie feels responsible for his death. And he might, (laughs) he probably must have been real old. His time is probably coming anyway. Well, he was. I, mean, I, I think I, I'm pretty. Well, you, I think, actually showed us the episode. Yeah, he was old, old, an older gentleman. But I mean, of all the episodes that could be online, this is the one we get. I mean, we have all this about the ex-wife and going to New York uh, for the uh, radio station and the the, t- the TV talk show and the crossovers and whatnot, and uh, all the the relationship issues. Uh, that the daughters are having, and we get the piano teacher who lives in the same apartment complex. He's a pain in the butt, and he dies, and he's sitting there in rigor mortis on the on the uh, the recliner. And Ruthie doesn't uh, not just uh, she doesn't just feel responsible for his death; she doesn't know what to do. So I mean, they, they put like a tarp over him or a blanket, and yeah, oh, we got to hide the body because we're gonna be. Uh, arrested for murder or something like that. It, Like I said, if, if there was any other episode online, I would have loved to see it. But this is the one we got. And we just got, got to work with what we uh, have available. Yes, just like how we unfortunately didn't have any Mr. Smith to work with. Oh, but we had fun doing that. Yeah, we did. Episode 30, Morgan's blind nephew gets a sympathetic Ruthie to be his date. Aww. Yeah, it sounds like pity date there. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, uh, thirty-one. Well, well, it was with well, it was with it was with Kim Richards. So draw your own conclusion. He was still blind. Uh, Aww. <laughs> a- 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 episode Aww. what? What? Am I wrong? No, no, no. Episode thirty-one. Larry meets a female tenant who happens to be Tommy's mother in his building's laundry room, and things get very serious. Wow, chicka, wow, wow. Oh, God. Next episode. This is actually a three-part episode. Larry's midlife crisis. Larry uses his radio show to protest destruction of a local hotel housing senior citizens. He then ends up in jail and is fired from his radio job. No! Uh Uh-oh. Well, I, I, again, I think we've seen this in the past in some other episodes, uh, other shows, but in different ways. Because I remember there was, it may have been a just a one-part episode, maybe a two-part episode of Night Court, where Bull didn't want a theater to be destroyed, and he actually chained himself to the theater. And uh, ultimately what happened is the theater got saved because uh, the whole gang at Night Court acquired enough proxies uh, of the shares of the stocks to basically say, no, we're not going to destruct this, uh, this historic theater. That's the, that's the plot of UHF, dude. No, but UHF involved the television station. That's different. And then part two, Larry seeks new job offers after the loss of his radio job. And then uh, uh, part three, Morgan also finds herself jobless. And Larry confronts the station's boss's son in order to at least try to get her job back at the radio station. Then uh, episodes 35 and 36, a two-part episode. So we're, we went from a three-parter to a two-parter. Ruthie wants to go to a big concert, but it is sold out. Luckily, her DJ father, I don't know if I'd call him a DJ, but okay, her DJ father helped give the young man his first break on the radio back in L.A. Larry takes the girls to see the singer Kurt Stone in his hotel but later on, after Larry says no to Diane, she decides to run away from home to visit the rock star in San Francisco. What is it with these girls running away? One of them tried to run away back to L.A. to visit her long-lost boyfriend. And now, this time, 
uh, one of the uh, daughters tries to run away to San Francisco to be with this rock star. That's I guess the daughters don't want to be. That's the way it is with kids today. They don't want to be near McLean Stevenson that much. Oh, God. Now, I, I just wonder if uh, all these uh, actors and actresses realize that Hello, Larry's such a dog. They're trying to do anything to get off the show. I'm going to oh. San Francisco whether you like it or not. Oh, boy. <laughs> Uh, part two, having run away to see rock star Kurt Stone in San Francisco, Diane must make a very important decision. She must choose between her new love and her family. Like we all haven't been there at some point. Second to last episode. Yay! Tommy asks Larry for advice on women. Okay, I'm done right after saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy asks this Larry. Kid's a- this kid's asking me for advice on how to get women. I'm like, no, you're on your own. You're on your own, buddy. Well, and now I read the second part. Soon, Tommy is in very serious trouble at school for kissing a girl in a broom closet. Oh, boy. Hashtag me too. Hashtag me too. Oh, jeez. And then uh, the last episode of the series, Morgan's new secretary dates Larry's father, and it soon seems that marriage is in their plans. You know what? That's a good. That's a good point to stop. That's yeah. a very, that's a very good point to stop. Now, okay, we've gone through the episodes, and 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 we did see a lot of realism in there, uh, especially with the girls' relationships, the the teenage issues. Uh, uh, let's admit it, and not just with the daughters. We just said the second to last episode, Tommy was asking for relationship advice or love advice from Larry. Yeah, you know, don't tell me that, you know, boys haven't done that in the past. You know, we, we've all had talks with our father or grandfather or somebody we trust saying, you know, can you tell me about the birds and the bees? So, again, there's a lot of reality there. So what really killed the show? Now, I've got five possible answers here, and we're going to go through them uh, one by one. Uh, ratings. I'm going to say probably not ratings, and I'm going to tell you why. It did start off low. It was in the 50s for the first part of the run. But then right near cancellation, within the last, like, two to three months, its ratings got better, presumably because of different strokes. And actually, within about two weeks of its cancellation, it peaked at number 31. 31 shows out of 69. Nice. I was waiting for that. So, And some of the shows that Hello Larry beat that week, listen to these shows. These are you know some long-running shows, some very successful shows. Hello Larry was at 31. Quincy, which I, Quincy was on NBC. It wouldn't have been – I don't think it was on Wednesday nights at that point. Uh, but Quincy, The Love Boat, which we mentioned earlier, Fantasy Island – and, oh, by the way, those were 32, 33, and 34, respectively. So they were all right below Hell Larry. And then you had Barney Miller, WKRP in Cincinnati, The Rockford Files, which admittedly that was like the last season of The Rockford Files. It was probably running on empty at that point. And a reasonably new uh, sitcom at that time called The Facts of Life. So I don't think the, – the ratings actually got better as time went on, so I don't think it was ratings that killed it. The writing. Oh, boy. The writing. Yes. The writing was very hackneyed. Actually, to say the writing was hackneyed would be a compliment. It was, it, it took, it basically took every sort of, we had the serial comedy element, and at the same time we had every sort of sitcom trope in the book. Well, also about the writing. Uh, and this is a, something I showed to both uh, Chico and Greg uh, a couple of days before we uh, recorded this episode. One thing I found during my searching for information on Hello, Larry, is I found uh, a, an installment of the comic John Darling. Uh, and it looks like it was, it was done by Tom Batuik, who is the person behind Funky Winker Bean and, um, and Crankshaft. Uh, and then somebody by the name of Armstrong who rings a bell, but I don't know. I can't really put his name to a, a certain comic strip. Uh, the comic strip is about the government bailout of NBC. 
So, Senator Vale, what's your position on the government bailout of NBC? As you know, I've always been an advocate of the free enterprise system, but if we allow NBC to go under, thousands of people lose their jobs. And even with massive government retraining programs, I doubt if we could find work for the writers of Hello, Larry. Oh. Um, that, that, that was a comic strip posted on May 24th of 1980. So even comics were making fun of Hello, Larry at this time. And, and the writing was pretty weak. Uh, so I think that's our forerunner for why Hello, Larry <laughs> got canceled or isn't such, uh, such a disliking. Uh, McLean Stevenson. Honestly, I didn't have any issues with McLean Stevenson here. I, I thought he did a good job as a father, a good job as you know playing his role as as a talk show host on the radio. I, I have no complaints about McLean Stevenson here. What about you guys? No, I think he gave it. I think he gave his all in this series. I really think he did. Uh, you may not be able to say that about a lot of things that McLean Stevenson did after Mash, but I really think since he was like the lead here, he really did try his best. And considering this was his third attempt at a series post match, Mash, I really think he try he was trying his best. Like God knows, I don't need another canceled series. I don't need it to be three. And to, to the credit, it did get a second season. It did get a second season. Like uh, I just mentioned, the ratings were good enough at the end that maybe it could have gotten a third season, but apparently the, the folks at NBC said no. Um, what about the changes that we mentioned earlier, the the whole shift from season one being more or less about the radio station to then season two, it's more of a family type of, or not to say family uh, type of atmosphere, but more of a relation, uh, a look at his his uh, home life. More like a, a traditional sitcom. Yeah, it didn't really seem to vibe. I mean, it, it seems like they were making a hard left back into, oh, look, it's a family sitcom right after it trying to be you know the 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 next family sitcom if that makes any sense well yeah i mean if you do a sudden format change i mean they didn't change the entire format but again there was so much change there were characters being added you had larry's father being added you had tommy the annoying neighbor kid being added you're almost saying at that point well you know we screwed up in the uh, to begin with with focusing on the, the radio aspect. And then finally, could it have been the equally bad shows surrounding Hello, Larry? Now, mind you, like I said earlier, you had brothers and sisters with Hello, Larry. That got canned well before Hello, Larry. You had Turnabout, which didn't even last, I think, more than six episodes. That got the can before Hello, Larry. You had Sweepstakes, which I think lasted nine episodes, and that got the can and then uh, ultimately, you know, like I said, it moved to Wednesday nights on NBC, and it had the perfect lead-in. And like I said, it was not just with another series or a good series. It was like a technically adjacent series, not a spinoff, but one that sort of intermeshed their characters. You can tell they really tried to make this show a hit with the crossovers with different strokes. Absolutely. So, so I think uh, in the end, we're going to say that what, what killed the show was bad writing. Yes. Yeah. I think, if, I think that, if you had a much better writing staff, this show probably would have gone on for like at least five or six seasons. So I think if we're going to put it in order, bad writing is number one. The changes from season one to season two might be number two. Uh, maybe tied with uh, that would be the bad shows surrounding Hello, Larry, but... Still, those shows died. It lived on. It went uh, on to Wednesdays with with different strokes. But then at the absolute bottom is probably ratings and McLean Stevenson because the ratings were going up and McLean Stevenson was very serviceable. Yeah, you almost have to blame the writing. I mean, you don't know, you don't know, make it onto TV guides uh, fifty worst shows of all time with good writing. Well, you're right about that, but also at the same point, you know, you've got McLean Stevenson sort of being 
in the same breath as Ted McGinley as somebody who kills TV shows when yeah, oh. it, 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 yeah he, he just took the job and he might have tried his best, but it's just coincidence that, you know, oh, Dirty Dancing didn't work as a TV show, another future entry, or Condo didn't work as a, a, a as a TV show, not an entry yet, but I'm going to submit it. So <laughs> I, I think we've gone through about 15 different submissions this episode. Yeah, but, but yeah I just think. Yeah, yeah, I just think it's bad luck with McLean Stevenson with some of these shows. I mean, if McLean Stevenson was an actor, let's say in today's media landscape with streaming shows and everything, I guarantee you he'd be like on it on like a Netflix show or a Prime show or on Hulu or something, and that could probably last three. But they don't necessarily have to care about ratings or anything. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, except Ted McGinley was actually on a, a show on Netflix. Future submission, by the way. And which show would another, that another be? Another one? Oh, my God. Which, wait, which show would this be? No Good Nick. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we mentioned that one, yeah. Yeah, because obviously it wouldn't be the Richie Rich 2015 reboot. No. Possible future entry. Yeah, I think we're going to get about 20 future entries by the time we're oh, done. Oh, jeez. So. Can we move on? Yeah, the last thing I want to mention, with and we, we've talked about this with other episodes, what about it possibly popping up on a streaming service or on DVD? It's owned by Sony, and Sony does have Crackle, and... They've had worse shows on Crackle than Hello Larry, I, I would say. I mean, I've seen, I just went on there within the last few nights and I saw what they had, and it's like, there's a lot of junk here. So, yeah, you know, might it end up on, well, I mean, anything's possible. It could end up on a streaming service. I'd love to see it. Uh, or even DVD. Yeah, worse shows have been on both formats. And Mill Creek has been putting out a lot of Sony stuff, so. It would be perfect for Mill Creek to put out. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be great. And honestly, and I told both of you guys this earlier, when I first looked at the uh, episodes and what their plot lines were, I was actually very intrigued to see these episodes. Not necessarily for the comedy, but I mean, you, you see the development of these characters. You see the growing up of the teenagers and their life struggles and the struggles – not just of being teenagers, but also being having parents that are separated and having crushes and yeah, you know, just the usual teenage stuff. It actually intrigued me a ton. So, so yeah, I do actually agree with you, Greg. I think this is one of those shows that would be perfect by like Mill Creek or some little distributor. I, I mean, I don't know what type of deal Shout House has with Sony, but yeah, it's one of those operations would be absolutely perfect for this. Or even better, since they did it with One Day at a Time, let's do the uh, 2019 gritty reboot of this on Netflix. No? Okay. Gritty is Hello Larry? Hello Gritty. Hello (laughs) Gritty! No, no. no. (laughs) Oh my god! Gritty as as the dad with, like, his two gritty-looking children. And on that note, <laughs> oh, well, oh God, so yeah, hello Larry with McLean Stevenson and a future Real Housewife. It was a thing on TV. It, it was. It was a thing on TV for about a year and a half. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Place to Nations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have over two dozen podcasts available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaceFoundation.com. We now offer them to you on two great feeds. On the PlaceFoundation Wrestling feed, we dive into topics running the gamut from today's WWE to the glory days of yesteryear and the ins and outs of the territory days. In addition to our full-length shows, we also deliver to you special pod blasts on topics old and new. The Place to Be Nation pop feed is a veritable treasure trove of great content. Offer tremendous shows covering the land of movies, television, life, comics, and sports, 
brought to you by the most knowledgeable and insightful folks in the podcast world. You can find all these great shows, plus archives of our past podcasts from over the past eight years as well by subscribing to both feeds on iTunes. And while you're there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows, plus others, available on PlacementNation.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth search projects, and much more. Be sure to support our site by using www.PlacementNation.com forward slash Amazon when doing your online shopping. We want to thank our friends at Boneheads, Wing Bar, ProWrestlingOnly.com, and TheHistoryOfWrestling.com as well. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. PlacementNation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Welcome to the It Was a Thing on TV podcast, episode 13, submission 180, the Tommy Westfall universe. Careful with that, son. Remember I told you that? I don't understand this autism thing, Pop. Here's my son. I talk to him. I don't even know if he can hear me. He sits there all day long in his own world, staring at that toy. What's he thinking about? All right, all right, come on, son. Let's go wash our hands, all right? It's all right. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm Mike Klaus, and Chico Alexander is with me, and Greg Diener is with me, and we're going to have a very interesting episode today because we're not going to focus on a TV show per se. We're going to focus on a concept, and we're going to have a couple episodes like this in the near future. We, we're going to have one about video games that were based on TV shows, and oh, we got some bad ones. And we've come up with other ideas like lunch boxes and action figures and and trading cards and, and uh, some other and board games. Uh, but we're going to focus on specifically something called the Tommy Westfall universe here. And you heard in the open the last few moments of the final episode of St. Elsewhere. And that's the basis of the Tommy Westfall universe. So Tommy Westfall is the a son of one of the doctors of St. Elsewhere, and this son happens to have autism. And he's holding a snow globe and is just peering into it, and he's uh, non-communicating, just peering in the snow globe, and uh, his father takes him out of the scene and tells him to put down the snow globe, the toy. And when you look at this snow globe, you see a you see St. Allegis in there, the hospital that... St. Elsewhere took place in. So now this theory is that St. Elsewhere is all in the imagination of Tommy Westfall. And over the years, some people have taken it further by saying, oh, well, this character from St. Elsewhere was in this show. And this it isn't just limited to characters crossing over. It could be products. It could be names but so at this point there's well over 400 shows within the tommy westfall universe which hypothetically if you think about it if saint elsewhere was a dream of tommy westfall wouldn't it make sense that all these other shows are figments of tommy westfall's imagination the first thing we're going to look at just for an example how this sort of starts how, how this ch chain reaction works of going from St. Elsewhere to ultimately you, you get into Doctor Who. Okay, how do we go from St. Elsewhere to Doctor Who? So follow along. So 
St. Elsewhere's Westfall Craig and Oshlander visited the Cheers bar. So now Cheers is within the Tommy Westfall universe. Cheers is Norm Cliff and Dr. Crane or Doctors Crane. They visited the Wings Airport. So now you've got the Wings Airport within the the, the universe. Cheers spun off the Tortellis. Future induction, by the way. <laughs> Uh, with Carla. And then Cheers also had Frazier as a spinoff. John Larroquette shows John Hemingway called into Frazier's show, so now you've got John Larroquette show in the universe. The John Larroquette show referenced Yo-Yo Dine, uh, who is also a client of Angel's Wolfman Hart. And then Angel was a spinoff of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And then Wayland Utani is also a client of Wolfram and Hart on Angel. And they made some of the weapons used by Firefly's Malcolm Reynolds in the Battle of Serenity. And then a Firefly class ship from the, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, the unique to the, uh, to the Firefly universe is visible in a scene of Battlestar Galactica in 2003. Uh, and even though uh, there's the Battlestar Galactica from 1978, that's not counting in this. This is just limited to Battlestar Galactica in 2003. And then Caprica was a uh, prequel spinoff of, of the 2003 Battlestar Galactica. But then also uh, Red Dwarf, uh, the crew of Red Dwarf comes across a spaceship graveyard, which includes a Wayland yutani ship, which connects it to Angel, and an eagle ship from the TV series Space 1999. <laughs> so, yeah, we're not even talking characters overlapping. We're talking props, merchandise, ships. A Klingon bird of prey from the Star Trek universe uh, is also seen in the graveyard. So now we bring the entire Star Trek universe into this. Uh, an eagle ship from the series TV series Space 1999 is in the graveyard as well. Now here's where we get to Doctor Who. The TARDIS from Doctor Who appears in the hangar bay of Red Dwarf. It can be seen during the launch of the Starbug in the episode Thanks for the Memory. I remember that episode. So that's how Doctor Who is now in the Tommy Westfall universe. And then it uh, also makes other connections. Uh, it brings in the whole Doctor Who thing, uh, not just uh, from the time era of whenever the Red Dwarf episode was, which I'm guessing would be the 1996 incarnation because that was a late 90s show. But now you bring in also the 1963 and 2005 versions because they all had a single canon, the TARDIS, and the incarnations of the different Doctors between all the versions. And then to take it a step further, since I know Greg and, and Chico like their Doctor Who, K9 and Company, future installment. <laughs> K9. K9 Company was a pilot for a spinoff uh, aired as a one-off episode broadcast as a Christmas special in 1981 featuring K9, the Doctor's uh, companion and Sarah Jane Smith so that's how we sort of made the connection between St. Elsewhere and Doctor Who that's what the entire universe is about and the, the universe is like I said, 400 plus different shows, and we're going to add to it in a little bit. Uh, some of the shows that fall under the, the Tommy Westfall universe, some big shows, 24, Adam's Family, Alf, All My Children. Uh, so now we're uh, tying in daytime soap operas. And Archie Bunker's Place, which if you got Archie Bunker's Place, you need to have All in the Family. Andy Griffith's show, we talked about Battlestar Galactica in 2003. Arrested Development is in there. Beverly Hillbillies is in there. The Bob Newhart Show, Bewitched, Brady Bunch, and also the Brady Brides, future installment. And the Brady Bunch Variety Hour, also a future installment. And the Bradys, also a future installment. <laughs> And we mentioned uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I mean, the list goes on and on. We mentioned Coach in uh, the last episode. Coach is in the universe. So, yeah, I mean, there's literally like 400 shows 
some very popular ones, some that literally lasted a handful of episodes or even never got out of the pilot stage. But but there's more, but, you know. Yeah, and, uh, and there is a resource. If you just type in Tommy Westfall Universe in your browser, it'll take you to thetommywestfall.wordpress.com. They have the entire list. They also have like a map, a grid, showing how everything is intertwined together. And, and it looks like like the worst street map you've ever seen in your life. I mean, it, it starts off with the two main branches. There two, there's two main branches, St. Elsewhere, obviously, and then actually Homicide Life in the Street. Those are the two main branches. Yes. Yes, because the St. Elsewhere characters of Dr. Roxanne Turner, played by Alfrey Woodard, and Dr. Victor Eric, played by Ed Begley Jr., appeared on an episode of Homicide Life on the Street. So, yeah, those are the two main intersections, Homicide Life on the Street, St. Elsewhere, and that spreads out to some 440 shows. And, again, we're going to add that in a little bit. The Actually, where the biggest connection is, from what I've seen, we talked about that this doesn't in- in- involve – just actors, or not necessarily actors, characters showing up in other TV shows. We mentioned props. One of the big ones, and this connects a ton of shows, is through a fake brand of cigarettes called Morley Cigarettes. Not Marlboro. Box looks the same as Marlboro, but it's called Morley. And I'm going to just tell you the list really briefly of how Morley ties into all this, because there's a bunch of shows and obviously that sort of gives you an opportunity to then make connections with those shows. So Jack Bauer smokes Morley Light on 24. Violet has a pack of Morley Lights in American Horror Story Murder House. Morley's are smoked in The Americans. Becker, too, smokes Morley Lights. Several characters on Breaking Bad smoke Morley's. Burn Notice features Morley prominently in multiple episodes. Hank on Californication smokes Morley's. They appear in several episodes of Cold Case. Pickles brings Richie a box of Morley chocolate cigarettes on the Dick Van Dyke show. <laughs> so, I mean, that predates uh, the State Elsewhere or, or the Tommy Westfall universe by a good 20 to 25 years. That's, I just find that funny. Chocolate cigarettes, Morley chocolate cigarettes. Dr. Mark Green finds a box of Morley's in his daughter's room on ER. Morley's are sold on Everybody Hates Chris. BB smokes Morley's on Frasier. In the one where Rachel smokes on Friends, guess what she smokes? She smokes Morley's. On Heroes, a character almost lights a Morley indoors. Morley cigarettes are smoked on Huff. Morley's were all, are, were also primarily featured in an episode of Jake 2.0. Morley's are sued for causing cancer on Judging Amy. <laughs> Morley's are smoked by Lieutenant Matt Cavanaugh in an episode of Killer Instinct. Lisa Prince on Kingdom smokes Morley's. On the L word, Bet and Shane share a Morley. On Malcolm in the Middle, Lois had a pack of Morley stashed in with other items she was hiding from her family. I'm sorry. Oh, God. This is getting a Hell! Joke. <laughs> Show Mannix finds some Morleys in an old suitcase on Mannix. On the Middle, Aunt Edie receives a cartoon. Well, I'm guessing that it's supposed to be carton, but it says a cartoon of Morleys. <laughs> a carton of Morleys. Morley's are common on Mission Impossible back in 1966. Morley's appear on a desk in Nash Bridges. A suspect is prevented from lighting a Morley on New Amsterdam. Porn stash on Orange is the New Black tries to light a Morley butt. And who hasn't tried a Morley butt? Especially on Orange is the New Black. Uh, Morley's feature in the Reaper series finale on Saving Grace. Grace is given a Morley by a suspect. Lip smokes Morley's on Shameless. George Costanza smokes a Morley on Seinfeld. Morley's are advertised on Sordid Lives, the series. Ray Butts has Morley on Space Above and Beyond. Special Unit 2 investigates investigate the case of a woman uh, stealing Morley's and other items from a convenience store while sleeping. Morley's are also seen numerous times in The Strain, that 70s show. Uh, Eric Foreman had to smoke Morley's as punishment. Morley's also appear uh, in The Walking Dead, Up All Night. Uh, Gary has to resist by Morley's on that show. Tara of United States of Tara keeps Morley's in her glove box. Halia on weed smokes Morley's. 
Breaking Bad, CSI New York, The Dick Van Dyke Show, ER, Frasers, Heroes, Mannix, Medium, Mission Impossible, Nash Bridges, Walking Dead, and 24 also appear elsewhere in the the Tommy Westfall universe. Whew. So, yeah, you can see just by a stupid brand of cigarettes or a pack of cigarettes or, or a cigarette, it, like, I don't know how many shows I went through, but they had to be close to probably 25 or 30 shows. That's a lot of cigarettes. That, that's smoking that's a, a lot, lot of butt. Oh, never mind. Smoke if you got them. Remember, kids, smoking is wrong. Indeed, yes. We, we do not uh, tolerate smoking. We don't want you to start smoking. It's a bad habit. We did not encourage you to do it. We're, we're just here goofing around. Yeah. So, yeah, th- uh, just that huge connection to just a brand of cigarettes. It, it, it's just amazing. Now, the big part of this episode, and, and this isn't going to be a long episode because it, it's just basically talking about uh, the, the connections and and uh, the, the different ways they're intertwined and how this could all uh, go back to Tommy Westfall in a very hypothetical sense. Mm-hmm. But we have some revelations of our own, don't we, gentlemen? Yeah, oh yeah. And I'll tell you right now, they're going to blow your brain hole. Oh, yes. Yeah. We're going to break the internet, as the kids say. We're going to break the internet, and it's not going to be because Greg is balancing a glass of champagne on his ass. I did not need that mental picture. Well, blame Gritty. (laughs) (laughs) That wasn't the answer I was expecting, but I'll take it. Oh, no, it's in reference to the to the picture Gritty posted of the day he debuted, the Photoshop of him and Kiss Kim Kardashian. Uh, he, he's he's right about that. I'm going to let Greg, since Greg, I think, was actually the person who discovered this. Greg, tell us what big connection you'd like to add to this. Well, guys, do you remember on International Women's Day when Buzzer had a marathon of all – Great shows that featured those female pioneers in television and game shows. Yes. Yes. Well, remember when they had Vicki Lawrence and Carol Burnett as their characters from Mama's Family? Uh huh. Yes. They had also opposite them, they had McLean Stevenson and Joanna Gleason as their characters from Hello Larry. So. Hello Larry! Oh, sorry. Yes. So, And actually, that's the reason why we did Hello, Larry! this week, and we're following it with this, because Hello, Larry! is one of a number of, of big revelations that we, we have. So Hello, Larry! was on Password Plus, or the characters on Hello, Larry!, which is already in the Tommy Westfall universe. So therefore, Password Plus is in the Tommy Westfall universe, but also because, as Greg said earlier, the characters from Mama's Family were on Password Plus. So that means the characters from not just Mama's Family, but also the Carol Burnett show now come into the universe, hypothetically. And really, if you think about the bigger picture, doesn't that mean Tommy Westfall also imagined the contestants who are real people? So that means Tommy Westfall created all of humanity. Not to be blasphemous, but you could interpret it that way. So, yeah, Hello, Larry's characters were on Pastor Plus versus Mama's family's characters. So now that opens a whole new, uh, a whole bigger thing, because surely there's ways to connect Mama's family. Well, absolutely. Mama's family was, for one, on Family Feud. So we could definitely connect Family Feud and Richard Dawson to that which then also brings in Match Game, and then all, obviously all of those shows, especially Family Feud, which has been running for, you know, 45 years or so almost, all the families that were on those episodes were thought of hey, by Tammy Westfall. Oh, hey, wait wait a minute. I just thought of something else. Mama was also on Jeopardy, right? Mama was on Jeopardy. So, wait well, a minute. 
Oh my if, god! If Mama created all the pe- if if Tommy Westfall created all the people that were on Jeopardy, does that mean uh, that this- Tommy Westfall created the Omnibus podcast? I think it means Tommy Westfall created Chico. <laughs> Is this oh, my, oh my god! Does this mean I'm a big I'm a big fan of Chad Allen's imagination? Oh my god! Well, oh, hold up, hold up! I thought like something. If Tommy Westfall created the Omnibus podcast, does that mean that the Futurelings are also created by Tommy Westfall? Which means they also created you, buddy. Yeah, I mean we're both with Futurelings, so we're all part of. Oh my gosh, I need to like relax, but. But also, on top of that, you actually brought in something else I was going to mention. You mentioned Mama was on Jeopardy. Well, Cliff Clavin was on Jeopardy. I mean, there's your Cheers connection, so that's a nice quickie connection. But also, who else was on Jeopardy? You had uh, Dorothy Sabornak from The Golden Girls. And so now you get The Golden Girls and Empty Nest. That's all in the, in the, uh, the universe. And Golden Palace. Oh, by the way, another installment, Golden Palace. But yeah. so you're 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 adding all of these shows, and again, I mean, now you know it's gone outside of television. This goes into reality. Uh, but also, there were some other connections that we had come up with, not just the Hello Larry characters on Password Plus, which also then had Mama's Family characters, but also Alf. He hosted and appeared on Hollywood Squares. In both the John Davidson version, and he at least appeared, maybe not necessarily hosted, on the Tom Bergeron version. And you can obviously make more. Well, well, Dance with the Stars, yeah. But also you can make more connections because the Bergeron version had Bear in the Big Blue House. Hold up. Bear, Bear Bear, Bear in the Big Blue House. Who? Sat next to opposite on Hollywood Squares, Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh, so wrestling is all part of the Tommy Westfall universe now. Yes. Entire, WWE's existence is all in the universe. And you can tie in WCW, ECW, AEW. You can tie in all that. Uh, and also, actually, this is a very timely one because of uh, who passed uh, the day we're taping. Uh, Big Bird has been on all three versions of Hollywood Squares. The uh, Davidson version, the Bergeron version, and the Peter Marshall version. Rest in peace, Carol Spinney. Indeed. Big, big loss. I mean, that, that really does sting, especially since he just retired. Ooh. So, yes. So now you've got, because of Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch, uh, I, I don't know if Oscar the Grouch did which versions of Hollywood Squares he did, but surely he definitely did one. But even if he didn't... Uh- Big Bird, was definitely sure. on, Big Bird was definitely on the Marshall version. He was definitely on the Davidson version, and I've heard he was on the Bergeron version. So that connects Sesame Street to all of this. And then by connection, the Muppets. Yes. So, yeah. So, so I mean, th- th- these are the, – you know, we're, we're making more connections here. And then also, Leave it to Beaver is already in the universe. How's Leave it to Beaver in the universe? So how does Leave it to Beaver fall in the Tommy Westfall universe? The mugshot of Malcolm T. Wiggins from the X-Files episode, Titonus, appears on the wall of a police interrogation room in the Veronica Mars episode, Leave it to Beaver. Additionally, the fictional car rental company, Larry, where Mulder and Scully always rented their cars, was featured prominently on Victoria Mars episode, Rat Saw God. So... Uh, I mean, it sounds very iffy and tenuous at best, but Leave It to Beaver is, it, yeah, it's listed on the, the master list as being part of the universe. So does that mean also the best sheet in Hollywood Squares Hour is part of the Tommy Westfall universe? That's where I was getting to, because if you remember on Match Game Hollywood Squares, the first half of the game all the celebrities had their real names. You had Richard Deacon and Barbara Billingsley and Jerry Mathers and Ken Osmond and Gallagher, who, who we all know was the manic melon smashing uh, freak from uh, Mayfield back in the, the last season. Okay. Maybe he wasn't, but that just sounds like a great tie in because 
Gallagher and the Leave it to Beaver cast doesn't make any sense. But the second half of the show, the squares and the super match, they replaced all the actors' names with their character names, except for obviously Gallagher because because Gallagher is, is a character in his own right. So you had Jerry Mathers was Beaver, and you had Barbara Billingsley as June, and you had Richard Deacon as Mr. Rutherford, and Frank Bank as Lumpy. So they didn't just come up with those names. I mean, those are the character names. So that, at least in my interpretation, brings Mass Game Hollywood Squares into the whole time of Westfall universe. And again, j- just by association, obviously at some point through like six degrees of separation or electricity or whatever you want to call it, we have somehow met those people somehow in life, you know, through different connections. You know, maybe I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, who knows somebody whose sister was on Mass Game Hollywood Squares Hour. As ridiculous as it sounds, that does tie in like everybody. Oh, I mean, I'm I'm guys, 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 guys. I, I just I, thought of something. Were you thinking Chico, of Butch Hart? Were you thinking of Butch Hartman just now? Yes, John Mulaney's sword. Not, not dead. Yes, Butch Hartman's, who was on Match Game Hollywood Squares Hour as a contestant. On the January 3rd, 1984 episode, as we all know, he went on to create the Fairly Odd Parents. So that means if Match Game Island Squares Hour is part of the Tommy Westfall universe by Butcher, I believe it's a, that means Fairly Odd Parents is connected too. I would agree with that. I wouldn't necessarily agree with the John Mulaney thing. But no, I mean... Uh, but- he was only saying it because he looked like John Mulaney, obviously. Yes, obviously. Did you see that? Come on. You don't think they look alike. I, I do think they look alike. That's the thing. But, yeah, so I can agree with that. Butch Hartman was on Match Game Hollywood Squares as a contestant on, as you said, January 3rd of 84. The last original, not original, but the last, uh, let's say, first run or, or episode in the first batch of episodes uh, that Buzzer has aired. And yeah, Butch Hartman obviously created the Fairly Odd Parents, so I don't see why you can't make that connection too. So that, that's a very valid point. I mean, he didn't use a character name there or some sort of pseudonym. It, it was created by Butch Hartman. I think it definitely falls within the universe. So, yeah, th- that's like our big revelation is we've just like blown this wide open because. Oh, wait. Let, what? Okay. Back. Okay. Back to Jeopardy for a moment. Uh-oh. Dorothy, Dorothy from the Golden Girls was which I on said. Jeopardy. Which James I said. Holzhauer was also on Jeopardy. James Holzhauer was also on The Chase. So uh, you're saying that Mark Labette is a figment of Tommy Westfall's imagination? I think I think Mark Labette is a figment of Tommy Westfall's imagination. Hold up. Wasn't Mark Labette also a contestant on The British Millionaire? Yes, yes he was. he was. So does that mean Chris Tarrant is a figment of Tommy Westfall's imagination? Which means uh, all of – which means – ITV Carlton, because he hosted the first ever show on that network, which was a Carlton New Year back in 1992, I believe. That's in the Tommy Westfall universe. It's basically all of ITV is in the Tommy Westfall universe. So that means almost anything on Brick Box from ITV is part of the Tommy Westfall universe. Precisely. Remember that next time you watch the Beltry Circle, San Francisco people. We're just coming up with more connections and, and revelations as we go on. I didn't see that one coming. But again, I mean, that sort of emphasizes the point that just through, like, attrition or whatever you want to call it, everything is sort of connected to the Tommy Westfall universe because of Password Plus or because of Hollywood Squares, 
or because of Jeopardy. And again, when we're talking about Jeopardy, they've had over 8,000 shows. So, you know, how many unique contestants have they had? Easily over like 16,000, maybe even closer to 17,000. Mike Riley was a contestant on Future Entry, but no, no, he was on Jeopardy who would host Jeopardy. Future Entry Monopoly. That's what I was saying. He would go on to host Future Entry Monopoly, which means Monopoly is part of the Tommy Westfall universe. But but wait, I, I'm going to take it a step further, not just with Mike Riley. So Jeopardy was created by Merv Griffin, so technically that means everything Merv Griffin ever created would be in the universe including the Merv Griffin show and Wheel of Fortune and whatever other shows Merv Griffin created in his lifetime. Monopoly was mentioned. Merv Griffin's Crosswords. Or Merv like Griffin. Another feature entry? Hmm? What? If you want to go back in the day, let's play Post Office could count. And there's uh, Reach for the Stars, which actually in itself, Reach for the Stars was the bonus round on Ruckus, future installment. So, yeah, I mean, right there, just with the Jeopardy connection, connecting to sixteen to 17,000 people, not even including the, the staff, and Alex Trebek, who, by the way, now we can bring in Pitfall into the universe. Previous we installment. Can bring, oh, hey, we, could, we can bring in... The, the final episode of the 1980 High Rollers into this. Also, a so future that episode. Means, <laughs> that means the that means the ten thousand dollar fishbowl is part of the Tommy Westfall universe. So yeah, I mean this like extends beyond like just television reaches. Now we've connected literally. I mean, just on, on the face value between Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. Probably in the range of what would you say, forty to forty-five thousand people have been contestants on those shows over the years, not even counting the the sixties Jeopardy. So yeah, I mean, so so we're probably looking at a legit forty to fifty thousand people right there as contestants, even after you add in the sixties Jeopardy. So yeah, this is like mind blowing because I'm sure everybody knows someone who's been on one of those shows, whether it's, you know, a direct friend or a friend of a friend or a coworker or some relationship. I mean, obviously the two of us have a direct relationship with, with Chico and, you know, hopefully me, call me Maggie. I mean, I have other connections to Jeopardy because my sister's best friend was on Jeopardy would have been almost eight years ago at this point. And, I mean, obviously a number of us have friends who've been on Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune or both. And then, sort of by extension, couldn't we then include other TV shows they've been on? So, like, television's Ryan Vickers, for example. He was on Let's Make a Deal. He was on Price is Right. He was on Wheel of Fortune 2. He was on Countdown, so now we're going overseas. So really, yeah, and and then you take Countdown another step. It was the first TV show shown on Channel 4 in Britain back in 1982. Does that mean Channel 4 is part of the universe? (laughs) So it gets pretty deep. As you can see, we're breaking the Internet. We're breaking something. I don't know what we're breaking, but... um, but yeah, this is mind blowing, and I'm actually going to submit this. I'm I'm, I'm going to actually tag the the Tommy Westfall Twitter page on this, even though they haven't done updates in about four years, three and a half years. This might be worthy of an update, at least for the connections of Password Plus and Hollywood Squares and Jeopardy using Cliff Clavin, and then tying Cliff Clavin and Jeopardy to the Golden Girls, and also tying it then to uh, Mama's Family, like you said. Yeah, and then by extension, I'm sure you can make more connections through hey, just those shows. Hey, hold up, guys. Was it Morge Simpson on an episode of Jeopardy? Yes, yes she was. She was. And, and, the the Simpsons, and the Simpsons did a crossover a couple of years ago with Family Guy. 
So that means Family Guy's in the universe also. Well, well, you Family Guy would well, well, it, it, since Jeopardy's in the in our hypothetical universe, Family Guy would be in it automatically because uh, Peter Heather Griffin Zola. was on Family Guy when he answered uh, who is uh, Zila uh, uh, Kiebert Zila. But also no, Adam, it, Adam it, West. But but so Adam and Adam West. West. But but also if we're talking about Merv Griffin shows. Peter was on Wheel of Fortune, you yeah, know, when he asked yes. for the Batman symbol. The so, uh, yeah. Or <laughs> uh, second Q, a third, third Q, Batman symbol. Is it Alex Karras in Webster? How did you solve that? <laughs> and but also, also but, Peter Griffin. Peter Griffin was a contestant on The Price is Right. Yes, he was. Uh, but but also just Family Guy I think connects to a whole ton of stuff because there's so many pop culture references that you know that, that come from shows either already in the universe or are not in the universe. So yeah, that that sort of has the uh, a lot of like pull, a lot of strength, sort of like that Morley pack of cigarettes. I think we've like connected. I think television effectively is one giant hallucination in the mind of Tommy Westfall. And you can thank us for that, Internet. Which, But there's another question, Mike. If all of television is in Tommy Westfall's head, what is television in the universe Tommy Westfall lives in? Think about that. I didn't expect such a philosophical question at this hour of night. My God, my head is my head is blown. Yeah, that that's a little too much to handle at this time, I think. Yeah, I I you know what? I think that's a good place to stop. Yeah, I'm starting to get a migraine. Thank you, Greg. So yeah, we're gonna stop right here. But there's the big revelation that we wanted to, to bring forward, specifically Hello Larry's characters. They were on Password Plus. And then Mama's Family's characters were there, with uh, also not just Mama's Family, but also the Carol Burnett show. And that connects to so many other things, surely. And that, that, can I, you know what? Comment on this, because this was actually a question that was posed uh, over the summer. <sighs> okay, this is A, for those of you who know me, this is part of the, the year-end quote wall. And B, this was an actual question asked by our good friend Adam Needif. Hi, Adam. <sighs> For 15 points. No, no, not this. this. Oh, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Continue. This is great. For 15 points, Will Smith's surrogate cousin Hillary appeared on an episode of NBC's hit sitcom Blossom. Another episode of Blossom featured Don Novello playing the role of Father Guido Sarducci, and Father Guido Sarducci also popped up on an episode of Married with Children. Stay with me here. David Faustino's character Bud Bundy also popped up on the Fox Network sitcom Parker Lewis Can't Lose. In another episode of Parker Lewis Can't Lose, Parker crosses paths with grown-up Eddie Haskell, who, of course, we all remember from Leave it to Beaver. His next door neighbors, June, Wally, and Beaver Cleaver, were all characters in an episode of The Love Boat. Now, there's this other episode of The Love Boat where all of Charlie's Angels are on board. In an episode of Charlie's Angels, Dan Tana shows up from Vegas. But that's not important right now. Remember when I said Parker Lewis had crossed paths with Eddie Haskell? Well, Eddie also popped up on an episode of Hi, Honey, I'm Home. So did Gail Gordon's character, Mr. Mooney, who you might remember from The Lucy Show. There's an episode of The Lucy Show where Lucy crosses paths with Private Gomer Pyle, USMC, who, of course, originally appeared on The Andy Griffith Show, which was a spinoff of Make Room for Daddy. On an episode of Make Room for Daddy, Danny encounters Buddy Sorrell, one of Alan Brady's writers on The Dick Van Dyke Show. Alan Brady later appeared on Mad About You, where Ursula was the twin sister of Phoebe from Friends, and Phoebe's friend Chancellor Bing shop on Caroline in the City, where Caroline draws a popular comic strip that is read and enjoyed by Daphne Moon, the caretaker of Dr. Fraser Crane's disabled father. Dr. Crane used to hang out at a Boston bar called Cheers, where Norm Clip and Carla encounter Drs. Oshlander and Westfall, but on, an, on the landmark 1988 broadcast, we learn that Drs. Oshlander and Westfall never existed, 
and that all the shows I mentioned in this question are logically the pigments of the imagination of Tommy Westfall, who is the only character who demonstrably existed on what beloved medical drama? That was a question on remote control for this year's game show Throwdown, and I was dead. And I think everybody in the audience was dead. I don't even know if it got answered because it was it was that lengthy, that well written, and that hilarious. So yeah, Adam Nedef, uh, if you don't know uh, him, this is definitely something he, he would do. Uh, brilliant individual, funny individual. Uh, also, gonna give him a little shout out here because him and Matt Ottinger, they run maybe the definitive uh, Bill Cullen site, the Bill Cullen Archive at BillCullen.net. Please go visit. Adam's also written a slew of books, and they're all top notch. So please give him some of your time and some of your money. You'll definitely be rewarded. Okay, does uh, that mean that Adam Needham's also part of the uh, Tommy Westfall universe? Okay, I better stop now. Well, actually, well, I'm, hold I'm, up. I'm, I'm looking yeah. here, and you mentioned Saturday Night Live because – uh, Father Guido Sarducci was on an episode of Married with Children, which I know he was, season, I believe it was season 10 episode. Uh, there was a seance for, uh, for Buck the dog because he had died. And oh, I remember that episode. He, and, and Father Guido Sarducci ran the seance. But the thing is, Saturday Night Live is not in the Time of Westfall universe, at least as of yet. But also, we could tie it in with Celebrity Jeopardy and Black Jeopardy, because and also Jeopardy 1999, because technically there is no Jeopardy. Uh, th- those shows don't exist unless they, you know, they came from Tommy Univ- uh, Tommy Westfall's universe. Again, we're just like blowing this so, wide open, so, like er- everything. So, so, so wait, wait, Sean. So we Carol Ham and Sean Connery is a figment of Tommy Westfall's imagination. At this point, anything could be a part of Tommy Westfall's imagination. So, yeah, we just, like, blew everything wide open. And, yeah, I think we all need our brains to, like, relax after that because we've done some mind-blowing stuff. So, yeah, as we said earlier, please definitely go visit uh, BillCullen.net. Give Adam Needif and, and Matt Ottinger some of your time. You'll love their sites or their combined site, I should say. As for us, I think we need to relax after this one. This this, this was quite a trip, and it wasn't a, a very long trip. It was just very a very deep trip. It was a very deep trip because the Tommy Westfall universe, fast as it is, yeah, it was a thing on TV. And, and even hypothetically, it wasn't just a thing on TV. It could have been TV itself. It was a thing. Tommy Westfall might be television. Oh. Yeah, that my brain. This is too, this is too deep, Mike. This is it, too it, deep. It's, it's, way, it's way too deep. I absolutely agree with you. Okay, Voice of B Nation. It's Greg back for you again, and I hope you enjoyed that look me, Mike, and Chico did looking at the Tommy Westfall universe. And I think it, it stands reason to say that Chad Allen is basically one of the most evil people on the planet. He has created all of television history, and I, I don't know what to say. I mean, we I mean, it, we broke the entire sphere of television, and it was all because the Queen Stevenson showed up on Password Plus in his character of Larry Older from Hello, Larry, back in 1980 with Mama and Carol Burnett. But enough about Tommy Westfall and his snow globe. I'm here to tell you about all the great shows that we got for you here at Place to Be Nation Pop, starting with the hard-traveling fanboys and in a bittersweet HDF, the boys bid farewell to their favorite live-action comic book series as Arrow recently came to an end. Nick and Greg, not me, Yever, Yever Greg from hard-traveling fanboys, delved into the final episode discussing the Easter eggs, callbacks, flashbacks, and character reunions that made the episode a fitting farewell to the Emerald Orchard. Also, what does the future hold for the cast and crew? Ooh. On this week in the NFL, the Cowboy, the legend John D'Amato, and the Volatile Cowboy Senior gave a Super Bowl preview for the ages. The guys broke down the game in all facets and made their predictions for Super Bowl 54 between the 49ers and Chiefs. I'm recording this segment the Friday before Super Bowl 54, so 
I, 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 I don't know what's going to happen in that game. So in, in case uh, insert play here was was a really good play, insert play by Patrick Mahomes was either very good or very terrible. There you go. Meanwhile, siblings Kevin and Mary host the Brother Sister Rewatch podcast. On the latest episode, they cover episodes one and two of the fifth season of The Office. The siblings discuss several topics, including Jim and Pam's engagement, the Andrew and Dwight and Andy storyline, Michael's progress with Holly, and differing views of how the documentary aspect of the show should be handled. On the latest episode of Diamond Conversations, Expos Fest founder Perry Giannis sits down to discuss why he created Expos Fest, his love of his all-time favorite team, and some of the amazing memorabilia he has collected over the years. One of the newest series at Place to Be Nation, Pop, Pop Goes the Classics, looks at the Disney animated features, and it kicks off as Andy, Miranda, and Chad go to a deep dive of the 1937 classic, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Also, be sure to check out the PTBN wrestling feed, which includes a dive into topics running the gamut from the days WWE through yesteryear. The feed includes the Place to Be podcast, main event, Wrestling War Zone, Extreme Three-Way Dance, Jenny and the Gems, Body Pressure Luck, and so many more. Subscribe today. And while you're at it, subscribe to Jennifer Smith's The Jenny Position feed as well, as it's the home of Geek and Sassy, Talk and Pop, Freak Out Driver, and Telling Stories, and more. And on the PTBN social media pages, the greatest sitcom of all time tournament is now underway. Gee, a subject that we are very, very, very familiar with. I'm sure it won't include Hello Larry, though. But we are currently in round three. There will be four matchups per day, so make sure to like our tournament page on Facebook or follow us on Twitter so you won't miss a single one. And, and we have officially kicked off our 2020 stretch project, determining the greatest WCW match ever. You have all year to do your research, promote masters, and build your list. Conversation rules can be found at www.facebook.com slash GWCW matches or on the Pro Wrestling Only message board. Be sure not to forget to check out placetobenation.com each and every day. We have new voices and fresh takes bringing you the articles on topics in the worlds of wrestling, sports, and pop culture, including Trent Smackdown on Fox Report, This Week in the WWE by John Crow, Paulie's Perspective, Jason's DVD Deep Dive, and Ben's Unpopular Opinion. And don't forget about veteran columns like Glenn Butler's Weekly Walk Around the Web. And if you're doing some online shopping over at Amazon.com, be sure to click on the Amazon banner on the right side of the Place to Be Nation homepage or use www.placetobenation.com slash Amazon, and it takes you right to Amazon and helps out PTBN with no cost to you. All right, time to rejoin my past self along with Mike and Chico as we discuss the third and final topic of this trio of episodes as we look at the 1979 heavily hyped NBC show Super Train. Welcome to the It Was a Thing on TV podcast, episode 14, submission 005, Super Train. Super Train aired on NBC and ran from February 7th of 1979 to May 5th of 1979 for nine episodes. All aboard! That was Chico, by the way, but... um, we didn't play the theme first. We'll get to the theme a little bit later because there's a lot to break down there. Greg's here, too. Say hi to the nice people, Greg. Hi to the nice people, Greg. Good job. You get a cookie. And I'm Mike Klaus, and this is bad. This is a bad show. Oh, God. So, so Super Train... Where do we start? Well, we'll start with its origins. There was a a, a two-hour TV movie, and, oh, mercy, was that a, a, a slog and a half? But um, I, I sort of wonder why they just did the TV movie to begin with, because they committed so much money to this, you knew that the series was inevitable. Well, the, well, the two-hour movie was actually a pilot for the TV series. Yeah, but they still, I mean, if it's a pilot, they still built this train and all this other stuff. I mean, you, you're sort of you know, committed if... Yeah, this is pretty, This was pretty much a straight-to-series order that uh, eventually became part of uh, a legacy for NBC at the time. Which we'll get to in a little bit. 
But uh, it, it, the big thing for NBC was they didn't outsource this to another production company. They did everything in-house. And the reason for that was financial. Super Train was surely going to succeed. You had Fred Silverman behind it, and you saw the popularity of the love boat. So you know what? This can't fail. Enter laugh track here. So yeah, so so the since they thought this is going to be this mega super hit following in the footsteps of Love Boat, they're going to reap the profits of syndication and maybe some sort of yeah you know, product licensing or uh, you know, selling it overseas. And they did actually sell it overseas. Yeah, they, they sold it to the BBC, but it they, was so yeah, rubbish they, sold, they didn't air it. They, they sold it to the Beeb. And we're not talking Justin Bieber. We're talking the BBC. And then they sold it for $25,000 an episode. But, as Chico said, it was so rubbish that they didn't air it. Yeah. So, good job whipping there, NBC. Even the, even the Brits have standards. They're like, no, we're not going to have our people suffer through this. And on top of that, just the costs of this train, we've seen different numbers. The number we heard was $5 million, but in doing research for this week, because you know, we do a minimal amount of research, I saw numbers of $7 million and $12 million. And those aren't inflation-adjusted numbers. These are numbers that I found uh, in the early 80s doing some search uh, – in some archives. So $12 million for this, this giant train that had to fit in two uh, studios. That's how big the set was. It had to fit in two studios. <laughs> it, it was, I mean, it was doomed to fail. I mean, just looking at it. And, and they made not just the big model, they made two smaller models for different scenes. They made a roughly one-tenth scale model, uh, one and a quarter inches to the foot. Uh, and what that did was it created realistic medium distance details. And then for long shots, they had a version of the super train at a one-quarter inch to a foot scale, one-forty-eighth uh, scale. Uh, and it was actually on a giant track, the... the uh, the, the little, the miniature train, the baby of all three. It was on a train in Los Angeles, an outside location in Los Angeles, and it had miniature towns and landscapes. And it was the track was three thousand feet long. So that's over half a mile of this little toy train. Again, huge expenses. I mean, they they really went all out. Uh, and actually, now that I look, I see a fourth number. So we had five million, seven million, twelve million. Now I see ten million dollars. Who well, did accounting is... at NBC in 1979? Well, why are we getting four vastly different numbers? And actually, there's a fifth number. I heard somebody say six million, five million, six million, seven million, ten million, twelve million. Well, are there no like accounting practices at NBC? Where somebody can go back and look at the ledger and say, oh, Super Train, it cost $5.2 million. Why are we seeing numbers like $12 million? Mike, That's horrible this accounting. Not, Mike, this was 1979. This was the time when John Belushi was doing coke in the lobby of 30 Rock. And, and he must have been doing the books, too, while he was at it. I mean, cripes, I took two accounting classes when I was an accounting major, and I – did a better job. What the heck? Seriously. Okay. All right. Now that we've thoroughly triggered Mike, um, the, obviously the star of the show is the train. Yes, the super train. That's a problem. I got uh, – well, the, the, I know the, the, the train is the star in this case, but the boat on Love Boat, was that necessarily the star of Love Boat? No, the star of the Love Boat were – the stars, everybody else was just secondary, but right. they made a point. They made a point 
on like almost every episode to stress just how incredibly decadent this train was. It's got everything. It's got a disco and a pool and a bordello. It doesn't I really got, have a bordello. I got a question. Why does a moving train have a pool? Why does a moving train have a pool? And, and and why does this train, for as lavish and extravagant as it is, why doesn't it have aisles wide enough for more than one person at a time? Well, uh, let me tell you, Mike, it runs on Time Lord technology. Well, I get it. It's like a TARDIS. I fully get that. It's bigger on the inside, but it wasn't big enough for, like, aisles where two people can go through? Nope. Come on. Okay. You have to have all that room for rooms. Well, but the, well, I mean, the sleeping quarters aren't that big on most of these trains unless they're giving people, you know, small bedrooms, like spare bedrooms. But, I mean, 22 feet, you could put in two small bedrooms, and you'd still have, realistically, maybe five feet of, of space in the aisle. No, like I said, this is ridiculous. I'm just, it it, it seems good on paper, but it's not really realistic. Well, I mean, that may be half the point. It's not realistic. But, okay, yeah, the train, what if the train has to stop all of a sudden and you're in the pool? You're going to get such a tidal wave, it's going to splash water. Wave pool. You're going to get chlorine in your eyes. It's going to start rushing out the... uh, the 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 part the metal parts of the train because of that splashing yeah that's a problem that's you know I can understand I can understand happen. if it's a jacuzzi but not a full size pool yeah it's a lawsuit waiting to happen that's oh, why they God. have the computer that's why they have the computer on board announcing attention may I have your attention please super train will be stopping in thirty minutes probably a signal okay everybody out of the pool. Yeah, and I mean, was there even a lifeguard at the pool? I mean, how uncertified was this? You didn't see anybody in the opening credits as, you know, Chet the lifeguard? Uh, no, we just saw the two personal, let's see, we saw the two personal trainers, we saw the conductor, we saw the porter, we saw whatever uh, Michael Delano does. Okay, space filler. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and and you did have Charlie Brill as sort of like a hairdresser because they had obviously some sort of salon on board you have to have some sort of salon on board if you're going to the disco later that night but yeah I mean it, uh, I don't get it I don't get it I, I'm just gonna that's gonna be this episode it's gonna be like subtitled I don't get it I don't yeah. get it can we get into the insane amount of promotion NBC tried to do with the Today Show? Oh, absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah. Because Gene Shalit, as 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 much as he was one of the preeminent film critics of our age, he is a company man. I oh, mean, he was a company man. Oh, yes. Oh, he is showing the absolute crap for Super. And then we get into the report by Jack Perkins. It's only ten more years before biography, Jack, so hold it together. Telling us <laughs> normally I you interview the stars of the new shows on NBC, but I can't do it in this case because the star in this case is a train. It's a train. Did, did Jack Perkins interview Mr. Smith? I would I would I hope to God that there's a clip somewhere in the NBC news archives where Jack Perkins is interviewing Leonard Fry and Mr. Smith. I can only pray. Oh, I don't care about Leonard Fry. I just care about Mr. Smith. But yeah, they did a piece, like a seven minute piece on today. Oh, and be sure to watch Super Train premiering tonight on NBC. Some, folks didn't, was... some folks didn't get the message. Mm-hmm. No, they were busy uh, going, my God, that train is huge. You know, even the biggest problem I have with the clip. The biggest problem I have with the clip is that is Tom Brokaw narrating the scene with Houston, Texas to that weird sesame
Sesame Street sounding music. It's like, what the hell is this? It's called the late 70s. I know, but I'm like, what is this? Where's, when I hear this music, I'm thinking, where's Bert and Ernie? Where's Big Bird? Why am I looking at a skyscraper, skyline of Houston? Some questions cannot be answered. No. So, yeah, I mean, NBC, like, put everything they could towards this. And they gave it. They gave it everything they got on this show. Oh, yes. And and we're going to get into um, some of the changes that happened over time a little bit later. The one thing, and I, I told Chico and Greg this earlier, that was really lacking on Super Train was they didn't really have the star power that you had on Love Boat. You had Bernie Capel, and we know what he brings to the table. Fred Grandy, I, I believe, was reasonably new to the uh, business at the time. This is like his first major show, but Bernie Capel had been on Get Smart and uh, a number of other shows before then. Uh-huh. And, and, and so you, you had these, star, these known quantities on Love Boat. There were known quantities on Super Train, but the other names just weren't familiar, really. So the first, oh, first we've got to start off with, with the, the pilot the person who built the super train. I'm doing this for Greg because, uh, yes. oh, yeah, Greg, Greg like ranted and raved about this the other night. So the person that built the super train, or at least the 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 the, the business that uh, created the super train, tell them uh, who it was and and the whole story behind that. Yes, the, the creator of the super train was the actor Keenan Wynn. Now, Keenan Wynn, you might know as the villain Alonzo P. Hawk in various Disney movies like the, the uh, Absent-Minded Professor. He was kind of like the prototypical Thanos of his day. He would kind of just randomly show up in these Disney movies as this this villain Alonzo Hawk. It was, it was really something. Greg is an expert on Disney movie and, villains, and, by the way. And, and also, his name isn't just Keenan Wynn. His full name is Francis Xavier Aloysius James Jeremiah Keenan Wynn. Yeah, if you want to play a big ass villain in a Disney movie, you got to have like a real name. The the seven name rule is in effect. Yes. So Keenan Wynn plays Winfield Root, the chairman at the fictitious Trans Ally Corporation, and he mentions to his board at a meeting he will create the first transcontinental railroad that will be capable of going from New York to Los Angeles in 36 hours. And then a guy says, you know, Winfield, I think you're letting your psychotic fascination with railroads put you into a suicidal gamble with this company. And so Winfield Root's like, "Uh uh-huh, is that a bet? Well, guess what, folks? Here's a painting of the super train. And he reveals it, and they're like, oh, my God, this is incredible. That's how you win a room. Just, just... Like, this is, it's like, like, it's like, bitch, challenge accepted, let's go. Well, also, uh, also, I think he, he sold it on, it was an atom-powered steam turbine. Yeah. Because technically, isn't everything, like, atom-powered? Well, that, not in that sense, but, you know, everything is made up of atoms. Never mind, I'm, I'm not a science teacher. But, so, Yeah. And then uh, 22 months later, it made its maiden voyage out of Grand Central Terminal, New York City. Now, here's the thing I don't get. I've taken a train to New York City before. You don't go to Grand Central. You go You go to Penn Station. You leave out of Penn yeah. Station. Yeah, that's where the action is. That's where if you want to go to the Madison Square Garden, baby, you go to Penn Station. Yeah, you go to Penn Station, and if you want to take anywhere, you want to take the train to anywhere that is not New York City, you go out of Penn Station. You don't go out of Grand Central. Well, I, I'm going to offer why it was probably chosen. Grand Central Station, I, I think, is more popular than Penn Station, even though Penn Station may be more worthwhile. Got to go for a name. True. Yeah. So, uh,. Also about Trans Allied Corporation, Greg said that Winfield Root was the chairman of this company. Who else was employed by the Trans Allied Corporation? 
I see your hand, Greg. Mr. Drummond. Mr. Dr- uh, Drummond from uh, from Different Strokes. And what does that mean, Greg? That means that Super Train takes place in the same universe as Hello, Larry. <laughs> S- Super Train is part of the Tommy Westfall universe. Exactly. That too. Uh, but but okay but yeah I mean not only is it in the Tommy Westfall universe but you're right since uh, different strokes and Hello Larry had crossover episodes and they're in the same universe as as uh, if you will then Super Train has to be in that universe too. So you're saying Super Train doesn't exist then? Super Train is a figment of Tommy Westfall's imagination. That would explain so much. And th- wouldn't that also make NBC part of Tommy Westfall's imagination? So, so Tommy Westfall almost made NBC go bankrupt because of this. And Tommy so- Westfall's a tyrant. Yeah, that Chad Allen, he's evil. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the cast of the show. Uh, there's a few names you've heard. Uh, uh, Edward Andrews was uh, Harry Flood. The conductor of the Super Train. Yeah, the conductor. And Patrick Collins was Dave Noonan. Who was sort of the uh, social director. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Kind of, sort of. Okay, one name that's somewhat familiar. Harrison Page. He was George Boone. The porter. Yeah. This is this is, this is is where you have the sort of PC police come, because... He got the only black dude on the cast, and he's the porter. And then you have Robert Alda, uh, Alan's father, who played Dr. Dan Lewis. Because every good train needs a doctor. Absolutely. Nina Talbot was Rose Casey. The uh, nurse to Dr. Lewis. I do believe so. Erica Wells was Gilda, and Bill Knuckles was Wally. Bill uh, Knuckles. Bill, yes, Bill Knuckles. He who played Hawkman on Future Induction: Legends of the Superheroes. And, and they were uh, sort of the fitness instructors on the the uh, Super Train. And then Michael Delano as Lou Atkins. And here's another name that people will recognize: Charlie Brill as Robert. And they were sort of running the. Um, the hair salon. There's a hair salon uh, aboard the train. Well, if you're going to the disco, you need to get your hair game. You need to get your hair did. You got that right. You got to look good for that uh, that disco. Yeah. And then, at least in the first episode, there's a number of of big guest stars. Steve Lawrence, but not with Edie Gourmet. Interestingly, uh, interestingly enough, Steve Lawrence was by himself on this. Uh, you had, uh, we mentioned Keenan Wynn as Winfield Root, as, as the chairman uh, of Trans Allied Corporation. Ron Masak, he was on this uh, first episode. He of, you would recognize him from uh, Vlasic the first Pickles. Season. Yeah, well, I remember. Well, well, for, okay, I remember him from, from being the Vlasic Pickles stork. But uh, what were you going to say? The first season of One Day at a Time. With uh, as a uh, Anne Romano's ex-husband, I may be wrong on that, but I just remember him from Pickles. What can I say? It's a big deal to me. Oh jeez, I'm sorry. Go to your room and think about what you've done, Mike. I, I I'm already regretting it right now. And then Dandy Don Meredith was Rick Prince, Vicky Lawrence. She was Karen Prince. George Hamilton was on the super train. And then you had a bunch of people who don't have sources on Wikipedia. <laughs> oh, hold up. Stella Stevens and Fred Williamson were also in on the super train. Oh, Stella Stevens. Yeah, she's somebody. I'm sorry. She and, was a person on TV. And, of course, Fred Williamson. So you have two former Monday Night Football personalities on the super train. And even they couldn't save the super train. That's sad. And then in episode two, a a couple more names that you've recognized. Larry Linville, another MASH alumnus. 
Dick Van Dyke. There's a big name. And Barbara Rhodes. She was a name that floated around quite a bit in the late 70s. <clears throat> and there's like nobody on episode three. That's probably why it didn't do as well, because there was nobody on episode three. You need, and, 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 if there's and, nobody on episode three, then you've already lost everybody. And, and really four and five as well. Uh, episode six, Joyce DeWitt, Isabel Sanford, and Tony Danza. Yeah, uh, interesting thing about episode six, because NBC wasn't getting the return that they were looking for on Super Train. They actually had to pull it for massive retooling. Yeah, but also in episode six, there's a promo on YouTube, and also Bernie Capel, the aforementioned Bernie Capel, appeared on this episode, as well as, amazingly, Vic Tut. Vic Tabak. Vic Tabak and Jamie Four. And, and, Ma- and Mako. And he Mako. Of, uh, he of Samurai Jack fame. Yeah. I'm going to make an observation before we go on to the last few episodes. Have you noticed that most every celebrity on Super Train was on a show on another network? Tony yes. Danza would have been on Taxi. And Isabel Sanford was on uh, on the Jeffersons, Jeffersons. obviously. And, and Joyce DeWitt was on Three's Company. And Larry Linville was on MASH. Why couldn't they have gotten somebody from within? I mean, I know, I know times were thin at NBC in, in 79, but really? You really wanted McLean Stevenson on the Super Train? Hold up, hold up Mike. You skipped episode four because... <clears throat> Because there were two notable guest stars on that episode. Okay, I didn't see it on what I'm reading. Okay. It wasn't, it was yeah, because it did listen on with DP. But that's the episode that features Billy Bordy along with Ferretta Swit. Oh, jeez. And, and you want me to, to explain the plot of episode four? There's a lot to break down in episode four. Go for it. Okay. Oh, well, boy. I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to play the promo for episode four right here. On this week's Super Train Mystery, hail to the chief. Two dwarfs and a magician replace a presidential candidate with a double so real, even his wife can't tell. JJ, all I want to do right now is go to <laughs> On Super Train. Yes, folks, you are not just hearing things. That is the plot of episode four right there in a nutshell. Two dwarves and a magician replace a presidential candidate so that was so real that even his wife, played by Loretta Swit, cannot tell. When I showed this pot, this clip from this episode this, to a notable person by the name of Derek, his response was, after watching the promo, I couldn't do it. The title of the show coming in like the goddamn Superman logo in a cartoon is what got me. He could not make it through one second. He saw the he saw the logo pop up Super Train. He was like, "Nope, nope, I'm done. No." I at least lasted the whole episode, even though it took me about ten minutes to skim through it. Well, let me ask you something. Those dwarves were they Greg and John Rice by any chance? Oh, jeez. What uh, you needed a dwarf in the seventies? You go to Greg and John Rice. And if Super Train was around till the 90s, they would have tried selling you on real estate. Oh, jeez. And uh, the, the final episode, Barry Gordon and Rue McClanahan were uh, guests. Now, admittedly, Rue McClanahan wasn't really on a show at this time because you had Maud, which got canceled the previous year, or not necessarily canceled, but ended the previous year in 78. And you wouldn't have her going to Mama's Family or Golden Girls until 83 and 85, respectively. Which would just be sad. So, yeah, it, it just doesn't have the the star power that Love Boat would have because you'd have the guests running for, like, like a, it seemed like two minutes on every episode. And you'd be like, oh, I know who that is. I know who Elaine Joyce is. Oh, there's Gene Rayburn. And, oh, look at that. There's, you know, all these stars that you recognize and. They just didn't have it on this. 
No, they but, did not. But also, in addition, something else that hurt besides the lack of name stars, not just name stars, but a mass quantity of name stars, the changes. Oh, boy. Yeah. So NBC didn't like that um, they were getting what Dan Curtis had promised that he would bring to the table. So they fired him. They brought in Robert Stambler, and they basically redid the whole show. They brought him in to and redid the whole show to emphasize intrigue and suspense. Basically, make the entire show into an hour-long murder on the Orient Express. And then when that didn't work, <laughs> for the final episode, they actually added a laugh track. So now you're sort of getting even closer to Love Boat territory. So now it's not really Murder on the Orient Express. It's now Love Boat on a Train. It's sort of a comedy and sort of a drama. It's a, it's a dramedy like a decade before 30-something. So, yeah, they didn't know what they were doing. And uh, on top of that, like, everybody except Harrison Page and Robert Alda got fired. And, and, Ed, and Edward Andrews. Yeah, well, like, everybody except, like, two or three people got fired about halfway through the run, about episode four, episode five. And they brought aboard a new staff. And really the only name that I recognized on the new staff was Eileen Graff, who would go on to play – uh, Bob Euchre's wife on uh, on Mr. Belvedere. But yeah, I mean, they just tried everything. They tried a new uh, two-thirds of the staff being replaced. They tried going from th this murder on the Orient Express into a sort of comedy, and nothing worked. And then on top of all this, as I mentioned at the start of the show, I didn't play the theme music. <clears throat> Why not? Because realistically, there were three, and even if you uh, consider the pilot, four different opens on a show that ran nine episodes. So we're going to go through those really fast uh, with, with the first open and then the modified first open with a little bit different music. And the third one is what they used, uh, I believe it was starting about show five, once they cleaned house and, and retooled it like Chico said earlier. And you could hear differences in the theme song. And um, so here's theme one. open number two.
the final open. In addition to the different opens and the different graphics, the music. Oh, the music was amazing. Oh, the music, yeah. The, the music was done by Bob Cobert, who is – he's a living legend. He's like mm-hmm. 95 years old now, still alive, thank heavens. But he made some of the best music ever. He, he's up there with, say, Henry Mancini. Yep. Would you agree? Yes. I would, uh-huh. And, and again, his work is out there. Uh, some of the discotheque tracks that you hear on this show, uh, they recycled them and used it as the theme song to uh, two versions of Chain Reaction in the 80s. Yeah, you sort of hear that in uh, some of the opens, or in one of the opens that, we, uh, that were played just um, a few moments ago. But on top of that, not only do you have Chain Reaction in there, you also, you have this clip. So that music was reused. It was less disco-y, less brassy, and a little bit faster tempo. Do either of you guys know where that was later used about, oh, almost seven years later, about six and a half years later? Would that be the Nipsey Russell 1985 game show, Your Number's Up? Yeah, that was the win thing. When somebody won the car, uh and I believe it was when they won the the bonus game too. They played that music, and the thing that goes to my mind when I hear that music is I see Nipsey Russell marching around and just acting. Oh my gosh, just like a total goofball. <laughs> Commercial ground, but we'll be back, so stick around. So I don't know if you saw this on the Hail to the Chief episode with Billy Barty. Did you see where that music was used, or did you hear where that music was used? Um, can't remember. Do you remember, Greg? If you don't, I'm going to tell you. But is it is it Chain Reaction? Uh, no, no, no. The, the, this is the Your Number Is Up music. Okay. Did you see where it was used in that show in Hail to the Chief? No. Okay, now, if you listen to it, what does it sound like? It sounds like good traveling music, doesn't it? You're going past, like, uh, let's say the uh, plains in Nebraska or Kansas. That sounds like good traveling music, doesn't it? Yeah. What, What you getting at, man? It wasn't used as traveling music. That was music that was actually played in the disco. And they're 
dancing to it. I'm sorry. No, that is not disco music that I'd be dancing to. I'd be like, okay, all you stop right now, because, spoiler, in six and a half years, Nipsey Russell's going to be marching to that music when somebody wins a friggin' Jetta. Uh-huh. But no, I mean, seriously, it, 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 they used it in the disco, and that's like the least disco-y music that I'd, like, dance to. It's and, and 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 staying with the hail to the chief stuff, there was a uh, a segment where Billy Barty and his his compatriot, his dwarf compatriot, they were doing something. I think sneaking into somebody's bedroom or something like that. And did you notice what sound effect played when they did that? No, no. you didn't notice. I'm no. going to play it right here. It's the sound effect that was used on Jackpot back in the mid to late 80s when somebody got the question wrong and they had to cross over. That da 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 Yeah. That did sound like a little, how can I put this? A little like you're like something's about to happen. Yeah, it did sound like that, like something's going to happen. And they were being very, you know, suspicious. Obviously, it looked like they were, I, I believe, sneaking in somebody's bedroom or, or 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 train car, trying to steal something. And yeah, then they played the the jackpot crossing over music. I thought that was very interesting. But it's a very, yeah, kind of creepy song. You, you knew trouble was going to happen. Yeah. Tell you what, in the poker episode, they didn't really go for that. They went for some. They went for like generic. Ooh, something is about to happen. Sort of episode. It's like, yeah, we got Rowdy McDowell, we got Cleavon Little for this episode. It's like, what more else do we need to add to this? Okay, I got an issue with the poker episode, and it isn't about the poker game itself. Now, first off, the type of poker they are playing is not Texas Hold'em. It's not five card stud or draw or anything like that. I don't even know what type of poker they are playing unless they just made it up for the show. Probably just made up for the show. Yeah, but I mean, it, it looked like you know they're like playing Uno, you know, slapping cards down, and I, I had no idea what was going on. But the other takeaway from that episode in the disco, what would you be doing in a disco? Well, if you were at Studio Fifty Four, di- I'd be doing disco dance. I'd be what would I be doing? I would be doing disco dancing. Somebody would be doing something illicit. Yeah, I mean, if, <laughs> if this was Studio 54, you know, I'd probably be doing Lines of Blow with Truman Capote. But maybe I shouldn't say that because I, I've never done drugs. Don't do drugs, kids. But, yeah, I mean, somebody would be doing something besides this in a disco. What was somebody doing in a disco with the, the original the original theme to Super Train playing in the background. So, yeah, once they changed themes, they kept the old theme. This was music playing in the disco. And what was happening? Somebody in the disco was watching the poker tournament on a 13-inch TV. Who would watch poker on a 13-inch TV at a disco? And a bigger question, Mike, is why are they clo- – why is it this – this poker tournament on closed circuit, and why are people watching this on the train? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, th- this must have been some sort of secretive society or something. But, but you're on, you're in a disco. You're there to dance, have fun, and he's sitting in this corner or standing in this corner on uh, watching the poker tournament on a 13-inch television while all the music's blaring in the background and everybody else is discoing. I, that actually leads to the biggest issue of all regarding this show, besides, like, just bad acting, very few people of name being on the show. The writing is horrible. Horrible. Who goes on a, a disco in a train and watches a poker tournament? 
Degenerate gamblers? Why would they be watching a poker tournament in a disco? Yeah. Make, I, I mean, why? Make it easy. Do they not have TVs in each of the cabins or the bedrooms or whatever on the train? There's so much to do. I mean, that's like sort of going on a cruise ship, like the love boat, T E E. And you just like sit in your cabin all day because, oh, look, I'm going to watch what, whatever TV that, you know, I can't see at home. Oh, I'm going to go on a cruise ship and I'm going to watch Mr. Baseball a half a dozen times. Not that it really happened on a cruise ship that I went on back in 1993, but hey, hey, yeah, hey, it's Mike, possible. Don't you, don't you dare knock anything Dennis Haysbert was in, damn it. I, I wasn't knocking it. I'm, I'm telling an anecdote. Good. But yeah, I mean, it just was so bad. And NBC almost became bankrupt over this. And I got to thank Greg for this. Greg, I want you to share the, the, the link that you sent me earlier regarding Super Train about where one of the models ended up. Okay. In an article from Herald Mail Media, which was published on July 1st, 2018, headline, after years of mystery super train arises tv history item purchased by hagerstown shop owners after ben thorburn of coin op warehouse in hagerstown picked up a jukebox he bought from a jewelry dealer in philadelphia the man told thorburn about a train he had in an old barn thorburn didn't know what he would find figuring it was perhaps an old lionel train set thorburn climbed into the barn where chickens used to be kept and saw a grouping of dust-covered objects that appeared to be some type of train. It was much bigger than a typical model railroad set, with an engine and cars measuring about two feet wide and about four feet long. It appears some sort of peg... Uh, it appears some sort of pex... Uh, it appears some sort of plexiglass-like material served as windows in the cars, which sported a futuristic design. About a week ago, Thorburn bought the nine-car set for the man, which included long sections of track about 50 feet long in total. When Thorburn bought the train back to Hagerstown, he started searching online to figure out what it was. His research helped him realize what he had, the long sought-after super train. So this guy found the super train, and based on the dimensions, we sort of assume he got the bigger super train. He didn't get the little model that was on that 3,000-foot track. He got the 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 one tenth scale version, and I'm like jealous now. I'm I'm wondering where this guy is. He's not that far away. Hagerstown is Maryland, which may yeah. be about like seven or eight hour drive for me, and probably similar for Chico, maybe a little bit less. And actually, Greg would be closest. But I'm like want to go down there and say, if you're willing to sell this, I'll give you X number of dollars. A, 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 X could vary from a very low number to uh -huh. a to to a decent number, but I mean seriously, I would buy that in a heartbeat, and I would buy like shelving for it. I'd put it down in my basement. I mean that that's like a curiosity piece. I mean on top of being history, albeit you know not in a historical sense, more in a hysterical sense, but that is like super cool. It was in a barn in Philadelphia, and. This guy ended up getting it. So I, I'm actually very curious to see if if he still has it. And, and like I said, if he's willing to sell it, you know, I, I would hope he wouldn't ask for that much. But that, that's just too cool that the super train is now in the hands of somebody who doesn't really know what it is or, or does now but didn't when he bought it. And it was sitting in a barn. I mean, that's like horrible. That's that's almost like you know any sort of television history sitting out in the weather for 30 or 40 years, or you hear about uh, the mistreatment of some of these tapes uh, that uh, companies had over the years, and they just didn't properly care for them. That's crazy. Crazy cool, though, too, at the same time. So, yeah, Super Train, uh, its legacy, uh, well – it's definitely one of the worst shows of all time, and actually in 2002, TV Guide uh, ranked it the t number 28 on its list of 50 worst TV shows of all time, and I'm genuinely curious to know what the other 27 were that were better, because 
this is a class of its own. But yeah, uh, it was like universally panned. Even the new Super Train, it uh, it just just didn't generate any any excitement. I mean, it's sort of like they're polishing a turd. Excuse the the phrase. You know, they, they were. No, I think you were absolutely accurate there. Yeah, I mean, you you could polish a turd, but it's still a turd. And obviously they went through three different formats and three different opens in nine episodes. Yeah, th- this was horrible, 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 horrible. And even now it's I mean, 40 plus years later, it's still the butt of jokes. You know, not many, but the thing is, whenever you hear somebody talk about bad TV shows, invariably the first two names to come to mind are two shows we covered in the last two weeks. Super Train and Hello Larry. Oh my gosh, the the seventies wow. were a bad time for NBC and Super Train. Chico, take it away. Super Train, it was definitely. It was like Super Train was gigantic. It was silver. It was silver and red. It was garish. It was incredible. It was a thing on TV. It was a thing on TV, and it wasn't a good thing on TV. It was... It was a big thing on TV. I, I mean, I, I did last longer watching Super Train than I did watching Manimal, so... Yay, Fred Silverman? I don't know. <laughs> Let's just say th- this is part of the Fred Silverman legacy, which, by the way, we've been covering for the last couple of weeks, in case you haven't noticed. Yeah, and, and actually, this is like the end of the Fred Silverman era for now, because... Uh, we were um, we, we wanted to cover Hello Larry and Super Train specifically, uh, and then actually next week we're going to get into some very special stuff. We'll talk about that in the second episode this week. I'm not going to spoil it just yet. When we put the second episode up, we'll give you a teaser for Christmas because at least one of the episodes, I know all three of us have been like chomping at the bit to get at this. Oh, it's going to be a fun episode. One of the episodes is going to be really fun next week. Probably both, but we'll get to that later. So, as always, uh, go to it was a thing on TV.com. You'll find all the episodes there. You'll find links to our social media. You'll find our email address. You'll find all sorts of fun stuff there. We'd love to hear from you. And as always, we thank you very much for your patronage. And uh, until the next episode, which is actually going to be very similar to this episode. A bit. I'm not going to tell you how or why, but it's going to be sort of in the same vein as this episode. So again, as always, thank you to Chico. Thank you to Greg. I'm Mike. And we'll be back later this week with another episode. Take care.